Yeah. That's right. So, um, I'd like to call to order the Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board Meeting for Wednesday, January 22nd, 2020. Um, item 1.2, public comments on closed session agenda. Are there any public comments to closed session items? Seeing there's none, we will now go into closed session to discuss item 2.1, expul expulsion referral. 2.2, certificated public employee employment government section code 54957. 2.3, classified public employee employment em government code section 54957. 2.4, negoti negotiations update. 2.5, public employee discipline dismissal referral leaves. 2.6, existing pending anticipated litigation. 2.7, field turf light litigation update at Aptos High School. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, hello. Thank you for joining this evening. Uh, we'll be starting off with the Pledge of Allegiance and I will ask Trustee Shocker if she would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, agenda item 3.2, um, welcome by the board president. Um, welcome to the PVUSD board meeting. We have translation in Spanish. If you need that support, please see Virginia Gonzalez at the back of the room. She, she's hiding back there. Um, I would just, uh, let me see. I'd also like to share if someone has this, something to speak on the agenda, they must complete a speaker card and hand to Eva in the and Varentaria right here. Each speaker will have two minutes. Um, I just wanted to say welcome, everybody here. Um, my name is Daniel Dodge. I'm the new president for the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. I would just like to say thank you to my colleagues who voted me to this position. Um, I'm proud and honored to represent Trustee Area 4, which represents Mini White, E Hall, Watson High, and Radcliffe. Um, it's an honor for me because my grandparents they attended those schools, I attended those schools, my brothers and my nephew is currently a senior, and so I would just like to say thank you very much. So next off, we have Ms. Michelle Rodriguez. Okay, all right. I, I've been demoted, I'm actually Dr. Rodriguez. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> These students, no, no, anyways. So each year we work hard from our parents um, to hear from our parents and community through multiple LCAP meetings that are held throughout the district. Um, this input assists us in revising our plan each year. So stakeholders are able to attend any of these meetings. If you can go to the next page so that they can see it. There you go. So they can go um, to any of these meetings here. Um, if they cannot attend the meeting, they may also fill out a survey online, and it's right down there. Um, so these meetings, um, are additional meetings are also held with CSEA and PBFT as well as students. And those are not noted on the flyer, but we do work with both our fifth grade, our eighth grade, and our 12th grade students as well. So cada año trabajamos duro para escuchar a nuestros padres y la comunidad a través de múltiples reuniones de LCAP que se llevan a cabo, a cabo por todo el distrito. Esa información nos va a ayudar con la revisión anual de nuestro plan. Los participantes interesados pueden asistir a cualquier de esas reuniones que se ven en la lista. Si no pueden asistir a una reunión, Pueden completar la encuesta que está en línea. También tenemos reuniones con los grupos de CSEA y PBFT, así como los estudiantes que están en quinto, octavo y también doceno grado. Um, y esos no están anotados ahí en el volante. 
at the meeting, stakeholders hear from fellow cabinet members and me about the district direction and accomplishments. They also hear a presentation from site principals with site specific information, and then they provide both input and feedback. So in las reuniones, los participantes van a escuchar a miembros del gabinete y también a mí hablando sobre la dirección y los logros del distrito. También van a recibir una presentación de los directores con información específica de cada escuela y luego tendrán la oportunidad de dar su opinión y comentarios. So in an effort to ensure parents and community members know about these meetings, we are promoting on social media through an all-call system, Peach Jar, our website, local media, and now at Green Valley Cinema. Um, so we're not actually going to do the video because okay. there's a lot of people here. Um, we do have a video. Go to Green Valley Cinema and watch the video. Um, so in un esfuerzo para garantizar a los padres y los miembros de la comunidad que, están, que hay muchos en las reuniones, um, tenemos promociones en las redes sociales a través del sistema de las llamadas, Peach Jar, nuestra página de internet, medios locales y ahora en el cinema de Green Valley. So, tenemos un video. Si no, sígueme en um, Twitter y ahí están. So, if you want to see it, you can follow me on Twitter and it's on there as well. So, thank you. Before we move on to item 3.4, I, I forgot to mention, since this is my first time as president, that George, Ms. Trustee Georgia Acosta called me earlier saying she won't be able to make it because she's sick. So, hopefully, we could, um, hopefully, she feels better and hopefully, we could excuse her absence. Thank you. Next, item 3.4, governing board comments, reports on standing committee meetings. This is our opportunity for each board member to make a few comments. And we will start with my Vice President, Trustee Holm. All we have my comments. Student Trustee. Thank you, President Dodge. Last night I had the pleasure of attending with um, some of my colleagues um, Daniel Dodge and Jennifer Shocker. Um, the um, County Office of Education did a beautiful presentation on and a strategic plan. And I thought I saw Dr. Ferris Sabah in the room somewhere. Good job, Ferris. I was very impressed with the strategic plan and all the um, efforts that you're making to improve educational outcomes and equity for students in this county. So, very, yeah, very happy you're in your position and it was a great presentation. I also attended the school board association meeting where all the other school boards send representatives and we all meet together and discuss really important things to help kids. So thank you. Glad you guys are all here. Karen, do you want to say something? Um, well, I should have us both talk. Uh, so. Maria and I were at the DLAC meeting, um, which was yesterday, and there was a lot of extra people there because we had a woman who came to talk to us about the roadmap, and she gave a fabulous presentation, which was, you know, from 6.30 to 8.30, about it and about... Um, um, you know, the four items for the roadmap that we have to think about. And she, she, you know, we divided up and started talking about each, each one of us took one of the items, the four, four items, and talked about them and presented them. And, um, yeah, so there was a lot of extra teachers there that are not using at our DLAC meetings and, and people there to hear what she had to say. It was really great. <laughs> Maria can talk about it too. Thank you, and thank you for being here tonight. Uh, we did have a packed house last night's DLAC meeting. Um, a huge thank you to Laura Diaz for the informative presentation on the California English Learner Roadmap. I also want to thank our parents for the thoughtful discussion and the feedback on the need to strengthen our current bilingual programs that we have in place in addition to the possibility of expanding access to dual immersion programs K-12. Um, so it was, it was really neat because we did get broken down into several different works. It was, it, it was amazing to see parents so engaged in the discussion. 
um, and, and all contributing their ideas to improve the um, educational experience of their students at their schools. I also met with the community uh, water center and I learned about the different initiatives to address water pollution both at the local and the state level. And I do agree that everyone has the right to save affordable and accessible water. And on that same note, I want to thank our teachers, parents, and students, and staff uh, from Maloney and Renaissance for your advocacy around the water, uh, water quality issue at your school sites. We are listening, and as you may already know, we will be installing four reverse osmosis filtering stations along with an additional two hydration stations at Ohlone and something similar at um, Renaissance. And we expect to have these in place in the next 45 days. In addition to that, uh, I look forward to attending yeah. the Paro Valley Education Foundation board meeting um, next Wednesday. Thank you. They're already in the morning for hydration stations there. Uh. Good evening. Thank you, Elisa. Here. Good evening. Thank you, all of you, for coming out today. Um, it's been busy. We met with some parents over break about some concerns and thoughts they've had. Um, I was also at the County Ed Office of Education meeting last night with my fellow colleagues. Um, thank you, Dr. Sabat. It was a wonderful um, meeting, great presentation about the, dist about the um, way the county is pursuing education for all of our children. I um, was also at the Martin Luther King Day of Service here in Watsonville at the Mariposa Wellness Center. Uh, my family and I did some volunteer um, work. My daughters had fun shoveling rocks, believe it or not. Um, I also met with Fitness for Life in Watsonville Pell. Um, we're trying to get some after school programs going that will benefit um, the children in our community. Um, I also um, was disappointed and have addressed some of our city council members that last um, Tuesday on January 14th, the City Planning Commission did not approve an amendment to the zoning ordinance that would eliminate um, the pathways that children take to school from retail shops for cannabis. So right now on the zoning um, list, there is sections of Green Valley and Auto Center Drive where our children from Cesar Chavez Middle School and Pajaro Valley High School walk every day. And should the city decide to put in cannabis locations, our children will be exposed to cannabis on a daily basis on their commute to and from school. Um, these are high visible centers that cater to um, children and families and people of all ages. So I think it's important for the city council and for all of us to write our city council member to reconsider this and have those walkways and um, zoning removed from consideration for any type of cannabis. I also wanted to agree with um, my colleague Maria Roscoe here about Ohlone Elementary. Um, Dr. Rodriguez worked hard um, with a company to re um, get the reverse osmosis installed. It was something that I was a little bit familiar with having um, done it in my home and so we were able to um, get some better information and um, a better idea and understanding of how the water can be filtered at a more affordable cost. So thank you to all the parents and teachers who spoke out and we do listen to you and believe your voices are important. All right, thank you very much everybody. Um, 4.1 approval of agenda, can I have a motion? I'll make a motion oh, to- Oh, one second, oh, I'm sorry. Um, th item 3.5, the high school board representatives. Uh, Diamond Tech, I heard Diamond Tech was here. Diamond Tech. Oh, oh, put it down, yeah, put it down so you can, there you go. Way down. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I came as a rep representative of Diamond Technology Institute. Um, so the first thing is that we created a Twitter, um, Facebook, and Instagram account if you guys want to follow us. And also um, before winter break, we did a college and career day. 
fair. In where many colleges came to our school and they visit and they talk with our students about the opportunities and majors and financial aids that their colleges offer them. And the Marines and fire firefighters came as well and talk about how um, how to get to their careers, how the schools and everything that they had to do in order to become what they were. Um, so our, each year, the Amit Tech um, usually adopts a family that's really, that doesn't have the privilege of having Christmas presents for themselves, and we bring them Christmas joy each year. So this year, um, the student council, they took a day off of their winter break and went to the families in order, I went to the families to give the present, the presents. We collected a big box, like um, you guys can see that it was really heavy to take it. It was full of presents as well. We brought two to three small boxes and we put it under the trees and seeing like the um the one the only the only family member that was there was a daughter so she was extremely happy and grateful towards us um so the first day of school we uh we brought an instructor to our school to teach us how to play how to play the drums um we started playing drums for like about 10 to 15 minutes and afterwards, they divided us into eight different groups, and we were we were supposed to create our own music out of all the instruments that it gave us. And it was really fun. Each student had their own creative way of, of expressing of expressing themselves through music. Um, as well, we day two we did three different activities. One, the first one was we did an osapo with the evil robot in which our students were supposed to um, take the evil robot through, the, through a maze. And it was fun, because we were able to make that robot spin, talk, laugh, walk. <laughs> yeah, we had fun. And the next activity was a blindfold activity in where um, a, every student were, were, we were blindfold, blindfolded, and we were supposed to guess which shape and color they were missing out of the 30 um, shapes and colors that were there. And at first it was chaotic because everyone was talking at the same time, but afterwards we started to calm down and we started to find out which one were the ones that were missing. And the third activity that we did was the launcher in where we were supposed to launch a star burst into a, ti into a tiger. And it was really fun because there were different type of launchers like that students created and it was, yeah, it was fun. Um, so we also went to CSUMB and MPC, and they taught us about the financial aids that they would offer us if we apply to their colleges, the programs that they offer, and and um, how we could apply to them. Mm. So last semester, um, our beach volleyball was a beach volleyball club was created. It was the first time that we had ever had a beach volleyball. So we are proud to say that we got third place in Division One, and hopefully next year we might get second or first place. We're waiting for that. Um, so Alianza, Lisco, and WCSI, C C WCSA, yeah. Um, they came to our school and we had different type of, of activities that was that were run by the senior class um, that they were able to do. They did the life photography, science experiment, business challenge, and engineering challenge. The one that they most liked was the life photography one. During winter break, a team of our students, they participated in ectic polls in UCSC in where they were supposed to go there and debate against other teams about philosophy in a philosophical way and the, um, the arguments, the topics were really difficult because some of them were controversial and it might have like, uh, it might have um, affected, like we might, we may have like discriminated or talked bad about a certain type of group but our team were really sensible about that topic and they did great. As well, we, um, in quarter two, we had we have had the highest damage tech 
um, perfect attendance so far. There were 55% of time it take that had perfect attendance. And we're looking forward to our KSBW field trip, our Muslantin kayaking, um, the beast battle of 2020, and the business board, which also needs some judges if you guys want to participate and judge, judge us and our business project. It will be held on March 26th in our mail center. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. What's up, hey? I see standing back there. Hello, everyone. Um, good night. Uh, my name, well, not good night, pardon me, but like, good night, like, hi. Um, my name is Omar Casillas. I go to Watson High School and I'm here to do the board presentation today. So at the, at the beginning of, this, of next month, we will have our career day, our civics day, which is, the stu uh, which is when the 10 to 12th graders get to explore different career options. We have 50 to 60 presenters that go to our school and show them like from people from the Marines, from people that work in Driscoll's and many other types of careers that students can learn about. While this, the freshmen get to go visit local services such as the firefighters, the police department, city hall, and learn about what these people do in their jobs. They also get to explore our, uh, our academies or career pathways through the recruitment days. They do one day of exploring the town and one day of their uh, academies. And after this, the following Monday, they get to choose their academy. I'm a health academy because I want to go into the medical field. Side note. Um, also, uh, we, will have, we will be having our carnival night February the 13th. There's going to be games, free food, obstacle courses, and other fun activities. This was set on by a student leader in our ASB class. The ASB is supporting him. Uh, this year, our, our ASB teacher asked us that we all find found an individual project that we were all passionate about. He chose to do a carnival night just so students can relax and have fun. And for seniors, it was it's like a way to make memories at the year end. Uh, everyone is invited. If any of you board members would like to come and, and enjoy it with us. Uh, February the 13th, and it's right after school from 3.15 to 6.30. As many of you know, we have the Belgard Cup, which is our friendly rivalry between uh, Pajar Valley High School and Watson High School. That is between our football team and has been going on for more than 10 years. Uh, on the other hand, our soccer team gets very excluded and we wanted to incorporate them, them, them this more year. So we, we are creating the Central Coast Classic be, that is gonna be on January 28th from 6.45 to 8.45. It will be start a friendly rivalry with Watsonville High soccer team and LSL High School, which have been rivals for quite some time now, but it's not a formal thing until now. Uh, Watsonville High will be providing a trophy that will be competed for years to come. And we also make this a blackout game similar to what we do with the Belgard Cup, and students who are black and gold get to go in the game for free so as many students as possible can enjoy. As February come, we get our Royal Hearts Week, which is our Valentine's Day themed week at Watson High, just to have fun with all students. It will go from February 11th to the 14th because there's no school on February the 10th. Uh, this year's theme is a punny Valentine. The days are you color my world, are you a smarty or a tough cookie? We make a great pair and I heart you now and later. They all, each day, like the first one is like stoplight day, which you wear red if you're taken, pink if it's complicated, white if you're single, et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> That's just one example of the days. Our dance is on February the 14th, and it's going to be at the Vets Hall this year because we do have construction going on, and our facilities are being taken up right now, so we're going to have to use that, and good thing it's close to us. The theme of the dance is going to be head over boots for you, so like every student is welcome to bring their botas because we're going to have banda. <laughs> um, also, uh, this upcoming month is mock, is mock trial month, well, like for people in mock trial, as we, as we like to see it. Uh, we have been practicing since September, and for anyone who doesn't know what mock trial is, it's a program where students get to get a case pr uh, provided by a program, and they get assigned different roles from attorneys to witnesses to expert witnesses, and they get to portray these roles and compete against other schools, and they get to win prizes. Last year, I was a witness, and this year, I get to be an attorney. It's very exciting and a great opportunity to learn very uh, helpful skills such as public speaking. I would also like to mention that our cafeteria remodeling has started and we hope that it is going very well because today we got more fencing and drilling, yay. <laughs> it was only 
this much disruptive during our class time, but it's fine. We're going to get into the cafeteria. I would also like to mention that we still have no heat and we would very much appreciate it if this got moved to a priority because our mornings are like 50 something degrees and we do have we did get little space heaters but they are not enough for classrooms or to heat them up in the time that we get there in the morning and like it's very cold in the morning so i'm having to go to school in like five layers and i don't think this is there should be a thing that should be happening especially considering we live in california which should be warmer but uh, that's another like global warming side note <laughs> but i just hope that uh, it gets moved up in the priority thank you for your time thank wait omar um I just want to let you know that I, I, I have received those emails and Dr. Michelle Rodriguez knows about them well, so we're working on it. So thank, thank you very you. much. Any more other high schools? Renaissance, new school? Okay. All right, since there's no more high schools, we are now, I'm sorry, going to 5.1, approval of the December um, item 4.1, Appro approval of the agenda. Um, can I get a motion? I would like to make a motion to approve the agenda. Is there a but, second? But wait, I'm not done. Oh, sorry. I would also like to move up um, item 9.1 to go after item 8.1 since we have so many families here and I know our colleague would appreciate that too. I'll second that motion. Okay. So, so can I go ahead and get a vote on that? Do we want to move it before public comment? I'd be fine with that. So then I'll, I'm okay. I'm ending my motion and seconding the new one. <laughs> okay, what a meeting. Um, so we're going ahead and move 8.1 and 9.1 before public comment? Is that what it was? For um, 6.1 visitor non agenda items. To move 9.1 to the fourth. Okay. So can I get a motion for that? You did. Okay. A second. Can I go ahead and get a vote? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passed. Six zero one. I will see. The next one is. All right, so 5.1 approval of the December 11th, 2019 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? Move approval. Second. I will call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. So now it looks like 5.2. Uh, uh, approval of the December 18th board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right, here we go. All right, next up we have item 9.1, which is to approve the Pajara Valley Youth Soccer League Joint Facility Use Report will be presented by Maria. Um, board Trust um, Maria and Joe Dominguez CBO. Wait. Okay. No. I thought we were doing 8.1 first. No? Mm, no. No. Just 9.1. 9 okay, 9 sorry. That's Thank you. But we're going to aren't we going to use him? <laughs> yeah, I mean, do you want to go ahead Michael and I'll just Jones. jump in. Okay. Michael Jones. Yeah. Sorry. With your permission? Yeah, of course. Michael Jones. All right. Michael Jones, thank you. Uh, President Dodge, members of the board, Superintendent Rodriguez and uh, district staff. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to share with you our proposal for a project to improve the playing field at Freedom School. I am Michael Jones, former Alianza principal, and here tonight as a member of the Watsonville Rotary and part of the Pajaro Valley Sports Foundation. Joining me are Liliana Diaz, PV United Board Director and Local Attorney, Gina Castaneda, juven Juvenile Probation Officer and Founder and Director of Aztecas Youth Soccer Academy. <laughs> Jordan Thorpe, realtor in Aztecas Youth Soccer Academy advisory board member. Uh, Jennifer Watson, soccer mom, and of today, realtor of the year. 
and member of the Aptos Tide Soccer Club. Uh, my fellow members of the Wattsville Rotary, attorney, local attorney Tom House and realtor John Skinner. And I don't know if uh, Gustavo Inderos is here tonight. Yep, Gustavo Inderos, uh, who is um, from the PV Community Health Trust, and Francisco Estrada, also from the PV Community Health Trust, from the Watsonville City Council, and a member of Watsonville Rotary. Now we will go on to the next slide. Good evening, board members and PVUSD staff. Uh, my name is Gina Castaneda, and three years ago I was asked to present at the Watsonville Rotary Club. And um, a couple of the questions that I had asked of me is how many soccer teams are in this community? There are currently 64 adult soccer teams in this community. There are four competitive clubs, two that have recreational programs, and approximately 21 competitive teams, I mean 41 competitive teams. And as you can see out here in the audience, these are competitive players for PV United under the umbrella of Pajaro Valley Youth Soccer Club. Um, I was also asked what the biggest problem was in the community um, that I saw as a juvenile probation officer and also as a local coach. And I said that there was not enough safe spaces or fields for children to play on. Um, Roland Hedgepeth also presented and he also answered with the same answers on a different date. One of the needs in the community is to have space, safe spaces for kids in our community. There's currently 184 youth that are on probation in Santa Cruz County. Sadly, there are 107 youth from the 95076 zip code. That's 58% of the kids that are on probation. They are from our school district. By creating safe spaces, you create opportunities for youth for engagement. By participating in sports, specifically soccer, and I know this as a volunteer coach, kids get mentorship, natural supports, a pro-social activity, structured and supervised supervision. They're taught life skills by our volunteer coaches, and they have a support network. We need more sports activities and safe spaces for our, our youth. Um, we need to meet the social emotional needs of the kids that we serve not only in our school systems but also on the soccer field. Our executive committee, as you just met, um, we've been working on this project for over two years. We also met with many stakeholders from the community, including the city council, board of trustees, um, people from the community, businesses, and other people that are concerned with the same concerns that we have. Our objective is to create more soccer fields so that our youth have opportunities to be able to participate in safe spaces and also engage in pro-social activities. These are our partnerships. Um, we are currently in partnership with Freedom Elementary School, PVUSD, Pajaro Valley Youth Soccer Club, and Pajaro Valley United, and we represent the Pajaro Valley Youth Sports Foundation. We are here because we want to create and build more safe spaces for kids to have pro-social opportunities in the community. Um, we are wanting to start with Freedom Elementary School is the first start for this committee, and we want you, as you can see out here, you know, joining us today, and thank you for moving us up on the agenda, um, we serve over 800 kids that attend your school district. Good evening, trustees. My name is Liliana Diaz, and I'm here as representative of PV United Youth Soccer Club. Um, as you can see, this field, this uh, sl slide outlines our use of the F Freedom Elementary School field, both projected as well as historic. We have been using the Freedom Elementary School soccer field for over 10 years, and can sum up the slide by stating that our need, this community's need, far exceeds what the field can provide. However, it is a great resource, and we look forward to working with the district to improving it as a start to more projects similar to that. As a non-school-affiliated soccer league, PV United offers recreational and competitive programs for youth ages 4 to 8 years old. Our recreational program caters to demand and has two to three seasons a year, um, two to three seasons per year, and each season, winter, fall, and spring caters to anywhere from 100 to 
300 students per season. Our competitive program that Gina referred to is um, also run year round and has 21 competitive teams currently ranging from ages 8 to 19 years old. They play and practice year round. As stated in my initial introduction, our need far exceeds what this project will offer, but this project is a step in the right direction and it will help alleviate some of the scheduling issues our club ha has had as well as um, some of the issues that our teams have experienced in offering more services to our youth. We look forward to using this opportunity to expand, grow, and offer more of our student athletes meaningful experiences. By increasing our resources, PV United look, is looking forward to being able to offer more opportunities to our local youth. Um, this picture depicts one of our nationally ranked premier girls soccer team that consists of girls born in the year 2003, currently sophomores and juniors attending your local high schools. At an international tournament in Barcelona, Spain in 2018, they brought home the championship that year. Last year, the same team went to an international tournament in France and brought home third place. This year, we look forward to sending another team to an international tournament. And with additional resources, we hope to improve and offer similar opportunities to other teams in our club. Finally, and this is my final slide, but we have more to come, I do want to say that we do pride ourselves in, in maintaining and offering a safe program for our youth. As an organization, we take our role as guardians and mentors of athletes very seriously, and I believe our track record speaks for itself. Our league has been using the Freedom Elementary School field, as I said, for over 10 years as good stewards for practices and when field conditions al have allowed for it, even for games. Our coaches are volunteers that work in and around this community. They have gone through rigorous training to become licensed, in addition to subjecting themselves through Justice Department fingerprinting clearance or life scan, as, I'm sure, as I know that your staff and volunteers are also are required to do. Um, and as part of their coaching credentials are required to every two years do an additional background check through the United States Feder Soccer Federation. They are required to do concussion training as well as safety or abuse training to maintain their credentials as licensed coaches for our club. Safety <coughs> training is critical to our program and we take it very seriously. Thank you. Thank you for having us. My name is Jennifer Watson. I'm here to talk about how well um, connected as a group we are. We've already, um, as you can see, have quite a few um, connections with in-kind partnerships. And the PV United Soccer Club has already pledged $25,000 from its non-endowed funds at the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz County to get us started for our fundraising. Well, we also have a list of local um, public and private donors to contact once we get the green light to fundraise. We've had a number of community members willing to help and provide locations for our fundraising, and we've encountered phenomenal support. With those, we've discussed it with already, so we just need you to say yes. Hi, everybody. My name's Tom House, and uh, as I said, we've been doing this uh, for a long time, and it's nice to get to a point where we can make something happen. This is a picture of the uh, Freedom Elementary School field that we proposed to use that was taken uh, with a drone in December of this year. As you can see, in the middle of the field, uh, the water puddles. It doesn't run off and drain properly, and then the field gets played on, and it gets all crumpled up, and then it gets invaded by gophers, and it doesn't uh, always have a good playing surface, and, and we're proposing uh, to change that. Um, 
It also doesn't have any separate parking for the uh, people that come to use the field. Pardon so me. I just want to interrupt you for one moment and let you know that we're at 10 minutes, so we'll have to Okay. Wrap. I yeah. will make it quicker. All right. <laughs> Can we go to the next slide, please? Oh. Okay. So we're going to put in a full-size soccer field that can double as two youth side soccer fields going sideways plus a separate youth soccer field plus the little blue peewee field in the back so anywhere from three to four fields at a time uh, complete new sod uh, re readjust the sprinklers um, put nets along the side so the balls don't go into the mobile home park um, and we're going to put a conduit underneath to put utilities and infrastructure in case we could ever get lights placed in there in the future and maybe uh, scoreboards and PA systems and things like that. Um, and then on the right side up there, that's a brand new parking lot that uh, is the big ticket item, about $63,000, so that there will be extra parking for the school and parking for the people that come to play on these fields. Uh, next slide. So everything we're going to do is listed on this slide. I won't say it all. The bottom line cost is somewhere between one hundred and seventy and two hundred and twenty thousand uh, dollars. Might be a little more than that because our bids didn't include the uh, little peewee field that we were encouraged to take on at the last minute, <laughs> and so we're taking that on too. So lease agreement highlights include the proposed lease agreement. It has an agreement between the PVUSD and PV United as the tenant. This agreement is not a sale. The land will continue to be owned by the PVUSD. This agreement provides that PV United will be allowed to use the fields. It's a collaboration between PV United, Watchville Rotary, Watchville Rotary Foundation, and the district. In exchange for no use fees, PV United will prepare the fields for soccer, furnish supplies, line the fields, and maintain the premises in safe condition. PV United agrees to perform normal maintenance, such as watering and mowing. PVUSD will provide uh, water and related equipment and will pay for sewer, water, and electricity service. PV United will re reimburse the district for their share of the electricity service. PV United will pay for other utilities for trash disposal after their use and portable restroom, restroom service. And we will maintain appropriate insurance. The term of this lease agreement as worked out with uh, Mr. Dominguez shall be 10 years with two five-year options. Lastly, we're just here to ask for you to please support our youth and our community. We also have nine kids that are participating in the Olympic Development Program at the highest level of the nation right now. And if we have any of those kids, I just want to acknowledge them. If you could please stand up. I know we had at least one of them here, but we have nine. And if we can continue to create opportunities for our kids to be able to achieve and beat LSL and do all the things that we've been talking about tonight, we really appreciate your support. Thank you very much. I'm John Skinner. I've been asked to answer your questions, but if you'll excuse me for just a minute. Thank you all for showing up. Your kids are remarkably well behaved. It's <laughs> <laughs> are there any questions? Before we get to that point, we're going to see if there's any public speakers to this. Okay, so it doesn't look like it. Next, we have any discussion from the board? I do want to add something to the presentation, if I may. Um, so in order to ensure we received input from the Freedom Elementary School community, including parents and students, I did direct staff to organize a town hall meeting. Uh, which was held November 5th. At this meeting, the community voted to move forward with this project and bring it to the board tonight, and there were no, uh, no votes. So everyone agreed to bring this item forward to, to the board tonight. And I just want to say that as a board of trustee for this school, I recognize the dire need for parks and open space for youth and families to convene, especially in the Freedom, Freedom Airport area. When we look at other city council districts, there's their parks. District three has no parks. There's no open space whatsoever. Um, 
So through this partnership, I hope we can improve the existing fields at Freedom Elementary School, but also support the health and wellness of our students and families by expanding community access to our facilities. So tonight I am asking the rest of our board members to jump on board with me um, and move uh, this item along so that we can kick off the um, remodel of our field and uh, give more access to our youth. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Karen? I, I'm uh, going to make a motion, and we can discuss afterwards if you want to. Okay. Before the before the motion, I, I think we still have uh, a trustee. I'll second. Yeah. As a board trustee for Area Six, I do want to make a motion to approve this item tonight. I'll second it. Yeah. Not, not make a motion. Second it. <laughs> not. You're right. You should do it. Well, that can we go ahead and take a roll call. I did have a comment, but that's okay. No comments. We can do comments still after. Oh, okay. Uh, to Serper, did you want to say something? Oh, okay. We're all over the place. I know we're all over the all place. Right. I just want to say um, thank you very much for all the hard work that you guys have done for our youth. And I know that this is something that is so desperately needed in our area and that children really need open spaces, safe places to play, and adult mentors that they can look up to and trust, um, especially those experiencing problems at home. I know that this is a great outlet for them to gain confidence, um, to gain mentorship, and to improve themselves. So thank you, and I wholeheartedly support it. I echo um, Trustee Shocker. This is such an amazing effort. I want to thank everybody who's a part of it including um, all of the different groups who have come together to support this. Um, as you know, our budgets run very lean, and um, we appreciate your partnership in enhancing the fields there, and um, I will support this. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I can just say thank you to the Rotary Club, too, <laughs> Michael Jones. <laughs> um, just and, real quick. Oh. And, no, I'm just, and, and for all of you, that are here, all of you young people that have come here tonight with us, you know, spending your nights instead of home here with us. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Good to see you all. Um, and it's, I think it's an incredible job that you're doing for our district in terms of, for example, improving the field. Um, and it's, and I, I know Gina Castaneda, I, I know you. <laughs> I know all the work she does as well, you know, which is great, thank you. So just real quickly, thank you, Rotary, the Health Trust, uh, Stekas, and I saw someone here who, long, who a long time ago told me, Dodge, we need more fields. <laughs> He's standing in the back, but I don't want to say his name. But, um, you know, I'm glad to be part. Thank you, all the trustees, and thank you for all the organizations for putting us together. Thank you. So with that, can we take a vote? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. objections? Aye. And passes. All right, item 8.1, is that correct? 8.1? Okay, 8.1, Watsonville, Watsonville Powell presentation. Um, report will be by trustee, or? Yeah. Is Cresta Angelo here? Cresta? Okay, yeah, I have to say. And Carmen Pachardo, are you here too? If you can make your way in the front somehow. Thank you. Okay, do you just want us to jump right in with all this? Yeah? Okay, it's kind of loud, but. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let me yell. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so I'm, my name is Caresta Angelo. This is Carmen Pichardo, and we were, we're here on behalf of Watsonville Powell. 
and we just kind of wanted to come and just give you some insight into what we have been doing, what Pell's been, everything we've been doing since 1998. So our nonprofit started in 1998 primarily as a boxing program. And as it was a what? Started a boxing program. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so, it's hard to hear you. <laughs> I can wait a few minutes. <laughs> wait a minute. yeah. Boxing. Wait. Boxing program. I got that part. <laughs> oh no, you, you can go. You can you sure? go. Yeah, just can, talk loud. Talk hurry. loud. Talk yeah. loud. I feel like I. No, it's okay. They're excited. I'm excited for you guys. You should be cheering. <laughs> okay, I think that's better. Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. So yes, we started, um, we established our 5013C in 1998 and primarily as a boxing program down in the 100 block of Rodriguez. And since then, um, we've evolved our programming to now how be housed at two sites. So we're in the north uh, part of town off of Davis Avenue, um, off of Freedom Boulevard, and then we still have kind of our south um, location, which this is one right here. And we kind of put a slideshow together just to eclectically show you guys what we do and the people that we affect throughout a year. Um, so this is just going to be going while we cruise through some stats for you guys. Um, so we have a site, like I said, the 100 block of Rodriguez where we started. And so now we're trying to sprawl out and kind of really try to serve uh, multiple locations throughout Watsonville. And one of the things that we have discovered is that transportation is a huge issue for the demographic that we are trying to serve. So a lot of the programming that we provide the community is either completely free or really low in payment just to cover the costs of equipment and maintenance fees. Um, so when we provide services, you know, we really are reliant on transportation. And so we partner with the city of Watsonville, which we are fortunate enough that we are in possession of three vans, which allows us to go out into the community and pick up kids and bring them to our site. We currently, with the two sites, we operate um, in some capacity seven days a week right now. Um, we have a staff of about 15 young individuals in our, um, in our division and we really try to hone in on what the needs are of the demographic of Watsonville. We serve as young as five and we go up to 18. So you can imagine the array of programs that we have to A, bring to the table and want to bring to the table so we can captivate kids at such a young age and get them in our door, provide that positive mentorship, just kind of what they were leaning on, the leadership, the positive mentorship, a safe place for these kids to come and be a part of. Um, so when we go out and promote our programming, we really start with a program and these kids tend to build relationships with our staff and with fellow peers that they may not interact with on a day-to-day -day basis in their school environment, which then allows them to want to never leave our centers, which is a blessing because we want them to be with us and be around that positive um, mentorship that we can provide for them. So uh, we do, like I said, seven days a week. And we last year served, and on an annual basis, typically serve between 400 and 500 youth throughout Watsonville. So, and with that, we multiply each youth participation by at minimally five to six hours a week. So you can imagine how that just kind of grows and expands and allows them to have that safe space and somewhere to go and belong to. Um, we, with our staff, not only provide recreation, but we also give them life experience. We really try to strive to give them an opportunity to see the world outside of the neighborhood that they think is the world that they belong to. So we really take them and push them and take them to local communities. We go to colleges and we travel quite a distance at times to give them these experiences to allow them to be a part of um, the world we want them to, to contribute to as they get older. Uh, yeah, and so Carmen here is gonna speak on behalf of a program that we very closely work with our police department. We are the Police Activities League, so we do have officers that come and frequent our centers, and we really try to bridge that gap and give an opportunity for our youth to see law enforcement as just a caring adult in our community that wants to make sure that it's a safe space for not only them, but their families at large. 
and so we have them come in and they volunteer. We have multiple people on our board that um, give back um, throughout the year and we really try to stress their interaction with our youth on a consistent basis. Again, a lot of them tend to come in in plain clothes. So it becomes a, hey, this is just another adult that wants to be a part of what we do. And then the kids are mind blown when they realize that they actually have a badge and a gun. You know, So it definitely allows that barrier to be broken uh, within our community and it allows the trust with our youth with law enforcement. So I'll let Carmen uh, take the mic and talk specifically about the diversion program that has been implemented in our community for quite some time. Hello, good evening. Um, please forgive my stutter, I'm not very good at this. Mm -hmm. um, but I do, I am one aspect of the diversion program that we have here in the city of Watsonville. Um, the name is Caminos al Éxito. It did start um, a couple years back, I'm not entirely sure. I wasn't here for the beginning, but I am definitely here now. Um, so this diversion program serves first-time offending youth who offend within the city of Watsonville. So that could even be Santa Cruz youth who are um, cited or arrested within our city limits, they get turned over to this program instead of going to probation. It is a completely voluntary program, so the youth sit in with a program coordinator that we have, along with their parents, and they discuss all the benefits of this program, and the parent and the youth have the decision to make whether or not they would like to participate in this program or go through the pro probation. Um, the program consists of a case manager who manages the youth, checks in school, grades. Um, they also assign a number of volunteer hours and pro-social hours. Um, I manage the pro-social aspect, so I guess I get to do all the fun things with the youth, and it's you know to my benefit sometimes as well, because um, they get to do fun stuff. So um, throughout the year, we have a number of programs, and we kind of, as Cresta said, take these youth out of the bubble that they consider their limits, right? A lot of the kids who I have come in contact with have you know, had a handful of kids who had never eaten at a Denny's. And for me, that was kind of like outlandish because it's a normal thing for me and my family every Sunday morning, right? We want to go out to eat. Um, but for them, it's a first time experience. So we, I get to take them out of that, their bubble of Watsonville and we get to go to Alcatraz and they get to, you know, do the walkthrough with the headphones on and ask all these questions, art museums. Um, we've done, a. Uh, uh, what is it called? Zip lining. We also do a Camp Hammer event where we invite all those kids to participate and they kind of mesh with our general population kids. Um, so yeah, that's our Caminos program and it is a great program and I think that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you. So I just wanted to emphasize one of the things that we are trying to do and have done um, in the years past and up to today actually as like Jennifer said we recently met with Fitness for Life we're really into trying to hit our community hard when it comes to trying to impact our kids and I'm a firm believer in why try to invent the you know reinvent the wheel when other people out there are doing things they may have some limitations within their organiz organizational structure um, so we're constantly reaching out to other organizations we've partnered with like digital nest we've gone to youth now um, now we're starting this conversation with fitness for life we are currently um, on one of the middle school campuses here in town, uh, Rolling Hills, and we're there twice a week and we're trying to expand just again the exposure um, of kids to A, our organization, B, to the mentorship that our staff bring to the table and giving them an opportunity to know that there's more out there than you know, what they may think is available because I have found with working with youth and I've done this for over about 15 years now, um, born and raised here as well. I know it's a lot of word of mouth and kind of trusting where you're going and who you're sending your kids to. So um, we definitely are trying to reach the kids and, and we really want to spark more conversation with campuses and just let them know that we are a resource and giving kids an opportunity to meet us and see the quality of service that we can provide outside of maybe what the schools are providing or what other organizations are providing. We do enrichment classes, we do life skills, we have martial art programs. I mean, we have kind of an array of things. And the other thing we pride ourselves on is really listening to the kids and giving them an opportunity to have a voice in what we develop as we look at programming from season to season. So really what we're doing now, a lot of what we do in our centers and after school comes from the mouths of the kids that 
ultimately we're competing with other things in their life. So we wanna make sure we're kind of on the cutting edge of what we're providing them. So that's kind of us in a nutshell. Um, we're willing to take on any questions if you guys have any for us or feedback. I just wanted to add a comment into there before everyone asks questions. So we know that our district is underfunded, right? And we know that we need after school programs. So that is why I asked um, Pell to come here today because they have some resources that they can help provide us with and possibly have a partnership with our district to take some of the pressure off of us and still provide great things for the kids in our community. Yeah, it's a good idea. So are there any public speakers to this discussion item? Uh, any questions, comments from the board? Trustee, the surplus. And maybe this is um, geared to um, the superintendent or the secondary assistant superintendent. Do, when we have kids that are having behavioral problems, can before we end up expelling them from the district, are those ref, can we refer to the Caminos program? And do we? And how often? And or maybe that's a question for Rick Edo too. I mean. There we go. So we do actually refer out. Uh, we have a school success project with probation as well. Also, Gina Castaneda, which was here earlier, runs a soccer league in addition to. So we do some of those wraparound services and referrals already. Could there be increased partnership with it? Absolutely. There's always opportunities and ways that we are looking to, to engage more. And we actually, to speak on that as well, so we um, do have a con an open kind of relationship with student services, and so they do um, have direct, a direct referral line to us for kids that the counselors feel would benefit from an agency like ours. So we've gone in and done a few presentations with that specific uh, group and let them know that they do have access to us and kind of what capacity that we can take them at. Because we obviously, don't, we don't on staff have like certified counselors, but we do work closely with counseling services and through the Caminos program, we have another program uh, that city funded uh, through our uh, youth development uh, division with Parks and Rec that they're getting up and going, which is also a case management counseling service uh, program where referrals can be directed to, and we're starting that process like now. We just wrote our first referral today. So um, we definitely have that access. So we definitely are in communication with on-site counselors and really try to like kind of push that information onto, the, onto that group, so. Anything else? Yeah. One question. Um, so the services you offer are year round? Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. They may vary from season to season, um, just obviously weather conditions, mm -hmm. but there are, we do have some staple programs. Uh, our website um, has a live calendar that has everything we're doing and as we evolve, it's posted. We do use our social media platform. We have a Facebook page and Instagram and we're constantly on there and we try to shoot it out to all the other um, social media platforms that target kind of the parent and youth population in town and really kind of push that information out as best we can and have that try to be as live as possible because we are changing. But yes, we are year round. Um, our centers are open year round. The only time we really close is kind of around Christmas time, you know, but other than that, we're pretty wide open. And would you be able to work outside of the centers? We do. So we do take kids um, to other locations. Like for instance, um, we lacked kind of that academic support. So we were taking kids to like youth now, just as an example. So we were going there. Um, we constantly take kids, again, to sites, local you know, beaches, stuff like that, um, art programs. Um, our funding is a we have a wide range of funding that comes through, through private grants, through our nonprofit grant entity. We have a leadership program that we're developing that's kind of been um, in play for the past few years that allows us some, some, some flexibility with what we can offer. But yes, we do strive to like get them and connect them to not only us, but to other agencies and other kind of business-oriented youth development kind of programs in this area. We've gone to like Santa Cruz, done stuff, mm -hmm. diversity center, art studios, stuff like that, so. Yep. I think the reason I ask, Michelle, and this is probably directed to you, is um, the um, it, to recover absences for weekends. I think, um, I, I don't know what your schedule would allow, mm -hmm. it, but I think it would be a, a great way to get kids more involved 
especially when it comes to the enrichment opportunities that you offer. Definitely. Um, or even for uh, students who um, do not attend summer school, have this be an option for them as far as, you know, depending what type of services or programs you're offering over the summer. There's um, parameters there for yeah. sure. Yeah. So I think that's those two ways where I can think we may be able to collaborate if Definitely. everyone's open to it. Yeah, um, I'm open to a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and we can have that discussion some other time, but I think yeah. um, it'll be interesting to be able to work with them, especially on the uh, recovering absences. And with being at different areas, areas of different town areas too, that might, too. you know, increase the, their ability to even get them to get to those locations themselves, right? So, because right. I know a lot of them, A, don't have the transportation or B, the parent support to be able to get to and from, that could be a deterrent, not necessarily to get to school, but, you know, mm -hmm. to kind of do that recovery on their own time. They may have some restrictions, but that is definitely a conversation we can have offline, for sure. Great. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I was going to say about the weekend. So, I mean, our, you know, I don't know how we can put it out to more of our students about the fact that they could benefit either on a Saturday and or a Sunday because it looks like you're doing seven days a week, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we should figure out a way, like Maria was saying, to cooperate with you folks in terms of providing students yeah. access, well, maybe even intended s stuff, but access to know that, you know, that's a, you know, who knows their options of you know wh what they have to do out there on s on a Saturday and attendance wise too? But I'm just saying, and a Sunday as well. Um, I don't know. There seems to be a way we could connect with you guys more for those kinds of things. I mean, and you know, after school is important too. You know, for children to know that they have you know other kinds of after school opportunities for them as well. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much for that presentation. Thank you for your time. Moving along, we, now we're back to item 6.1, public comment. And do we have public comment? Yes, we do. Um, our first speaker is Bill Beecher. Good evening, board. Uh, Superintendent uh, Rodriguez, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I'm here to... I'm here to talk about the public speaking time. It used to be the policy that uh, the public was given three minutes to speak. Somewhere, somehow, I got changed to two. I don't know that the board ever voted on that or whether it was just a fiat and then it occurred. Um, the County Office of Education offers three. Almost all districts offer three. Now, I also recognize you want to get out of here on a reasonable time. So I would suggest that you try something like this. Because, well, let me stop. There's different kinds of speakers that come before the board. Mm -hmm. I've been coming here for 12 years. I've seen a lot of them. Mm -hmm. A lot of them just want to get up and say something and support something and move on. There are other people who want a little bit more time because they have to explain themselves. Then there's a few idiots like me who want to get up and do a presentation. So I think what would serve the public well is if you adopted a policy where if you have less than four speakers to an item, you allow three minutes. If you have less than seven speakers and greater than uh, three, that you would do two minutes. And if you have more than seven, when we fill this room and you have all these people that want to speak, you're down to one minute. So tier it based on the kind of people that are going to come in front of you. Now on 9-6, I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to have to break my presentation in half and come back at another time because your time limit doesn't allow me to finish a very important subject. Now, EA Hall and soccer, you had a wonderful presentation about soccer at Freedom. EA Hall is also working on providing soccer fields at that facility. And uh, there have been quite a few meetings. Uh, I think you've missed a few of them. You should attend them. Thank you. Next, we have Melissa Dennis. Hello. Um, I've been coming to the board meetings for the last uh, few months to advocate for clean water after the discovery of chromium-6 in the water at Ohlone. Um, but I just received excellent news. Um, yesterday, Ruth Gonzalez, Joe Dominguez, 
and Richard Reed visited our school and announced that we will be installing reverse osmosis at our school site. Um, I was relieved not I was relieved not to worry about the water that my students will be drinking, and um, I'm just so happy that we're going to be drinking the best water. Um, so thank you. Um, my very next thought was, I don't have to go to the board meetings anymore. But then I decided that I should come anyway because I wanted to say thank you to Ruth, to Joe, to Richard, especially to Superintendent Dr. Rodriguez, and to our uh, Board of Trustees representative, Karen Osmondson, mm -hmm. um, and anyone else who worked on this who I didn't mention. Thank you, Kimberly DeSerpa. Thank you, Jennifer. Anyway, I didn't know the behind the scenes stuff that went on, but thank you to all of you. It really means a lot to us. There were lots of cheers, lots of happiness, lots of hugs, lots of water drinking going on yesterday <laughs> uh, because we already got the first um, reverse osmosis installed <clears throat> in the um, staff room just because that was the easiest one for them to be able to do. Um, so work is being done. We've heard hammers and drills and, and all kinds of construction going on. Um, and work is being done for the first um, fill station that should be coming soon. So we're all really excited. Um, just wanted to say your actions speak volumes. We appreciate it. Thank you. Um, you won't be seeing me at the next board meeting, um, <laughs> but we look forward to seeing you on your next visit to Ohlone. Um, well done. Thank you. <laughs> next is David Patino. Yeah, it's already up. That's how fast it happens. <laughs> Good evening, uh, board members and Dr. Rodriguez. It's always wonderful to see you all. Um, I'd like to just run through quickly a few ideas and a few thoughts I'm having. I'm a tenure teacher in the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. I'm very passionate about CT education. Um, I was hoping soon to have an update on the Renaissance High School wood shop. It's been closed for 1.5 years at this time. Most likely it'll be closed for the remainder of the year, two full years, a great disservice to the community and the students of RHS. I'd heard from the site that there's some movement on the project, but I've yet to hear a date and a time when the facility will be open. I believe after $100,000 of LCAP money, the facility should be able to be open soon or we should have a open on date next year, the year after, two years from now, three years. I mean, that's what project management is all about, is projecting these costs and when they can finally be realized. Community business owners approach me all the time to provide them with skilled workforce. And uh, my uh, answer is it's impossible without working shop classrooms. So it would be great if we could get this open and bolster our community's offerings and get our students jobs and employed. My passion is for students to be educated to the best of my ability. And this is the time of year that many students at Watsonville High School are completing capstone projects. This requires many extra hours and ensures, and this requirement is a, an important graduation requirement that's outside my scope of teaching on a daily basis. I will support student learning and student learning outcomes through the after school process. Meeting these goals becomes impossible when we are working to rule, so I would like to leave you with this thought. I would like us not to reach the point in the year um, where we do reach work to rule, I would like us to come to some type of amicable solution before the students are impacted because that's what's really most important to me. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next we have Stacy Anderson. Good evening, everybody. So I was just doing some research and at the last board meeting, Michelle was really concerned about, you know, making sure we don't lose our funding for the special, at, for SELPA, for our federal funding. And so I was looking into it and I found the legislative analysis report, the most recent one, and it says from 97 to 98, it was one in 600 kids were diagnosed with aut autism. And now it's one in 50. And this is a huge, obviously, it's a huge increase. Um, but I have some cur 
concerns about putting a lot of our kids in the SELPA program and integrating them into the gen ed just out of fear of losing funding. Um, so I have some questions and I, you know, just take them down. <laughs> um, how many of our students are on wait lists to be assessed? And what, how are we going to address this backlog? I know that we are understaffed and we're not, get, we're act, we're not getting funded correctly because these kids are not being identified. Um, what are we doing about that? And how can we expedite it? How many kids have clinical diagnoses of autism are, that are in the school district, but the school district does not deem them educationally autistic? And how do you account for them because they will still need social and emotional help and supports? So you still kind of need to account for them even though they may not be educationally autistic, but they're still gonna need supports, extra supports. Um, okay, Ms. Rodriguez, I know you're concerned about losing the extra funding. We have a huge amount of autism in our community. How is a district looking to address this? Has anybody contacted the CDC, the news, and let them know about our huge cost and lack of funding and under identification because we don't have this extra supports. What are we doing about getting the extra help? How are we going to get that? Thank you. Any more public comment? Okay. Um, next up, I, item seven, employee organization comments, 7.1 PVFT. Good evening, board. Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I'm Nelly Vaquera Boggs, president of PBFT. Um, Happy New Year. Uh, I gotta put these back on. <laughs> um, all right, so um, really great evening so far. Uh, we definitely make it possible for our students to be part of um, community organizations. And um, a really big piece in that are the adults that are there that are available and then in our daily educational lives the important piece is are, are the educators that are working directly with our students um, so PVFT we are all in as well we're all in it for the equity of our students we're in it for the safety um, safe working environments and learning environments we're all in for a sustainable workload, and we are all in for our educators' retention here in our district so that they can grow their roots in this community. Um, so when we are going into another semester, or actually I would say a third semester of negotiations over a contract that we um, sunshined almost a year ago, last February, um, it's there's a failure there's a there's a, there's a failure in this process and if we're gonna be all in every day for our students why are we keeping the educators out so I'm hoping that we can get something settled that you are able to look at how we're prioritizing our funding and allocating and where our funds are allocated so that we can offer something to our educators that is not an insult and that is not contingent on us increasing the ADA. Um, we're happy to go to the table. We're happy to go and eagerly, in earnest, negotiate. We could spend several days on it, but we don't want to spend many more months on it. We are approaching the um, state testing window. We have LPAC coming up. We have 
And then it's, it's eventually we're gonna go into um, April, which is our state testing window. We do not wanna pull our negotiations team out of their classrooms so that we can sit across the table and listen to, oh, we just can't help you out or we're not really moving. There's nothing feasible being offered. So we have made movement. PVFT has made movement on what we're asking for. And the things that we're all in for, we have put them into the language that we are, that's, that's our ask. We wanna secure those, the um, sustainable workload. We wanna secure that safe working and learning environment for our students by having lower class sizes and, and caps for um, special ed. That would be very, that would be beneficial. Um, so I'm asking that our trustees make an impression on the district and um, on behalf of PBFT and our community, our students, that we would love to be able to close this this year, <laughs> this before the school year is over, before spring break, that we can come to, um, I'll, I'll come to an agreement. Thank you. Next up, 7.2. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we have a public speaker for 7.1, Bill Beecher. Good evening again. Um, for 12 years, I've watched this negotiation sunrise, sunset. Um, it's been messy. There's one thing that I've seen that's been missing through all of it. There's never any talk about how are we gonna improve our academic performance? And that just froths me. I hear teachers want money, we want better benefits, but what about how are we gonna teach better? Now there are some structural issues that we have, which I learned from our COB. Um, we have about a 10% turnover of teachers yearly. We have a problem and you go, Part of that problem is we have some teachers that are struggling as teachers. I would like to see part of the negotiation include a resolution that both parties, the district and PVFT, work jointly to identify those struggling teachers and provide some kind of help to improve their performance. Because if their performance improves, by golly, I think our students will improve, and we need that. So I don't think it's too late to include that sort of thing in the negotiation. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Agenda item 7.2 CACA. Any representatives from CACA? Okay. 7.3, Pajaro Valley Association of Managers. Anybody? Okay. 7.4, CWA, Communication of Workers. So now sliding down. 8.2 data sharing MOU with the Santa Cruz County of Education report will be presented by Dr. Ferris Sabat, Superintendent of Schools, Santa Cruz County Office of Education. Thank you so much. Good evening, President Dodge, members of the board, Superintendent Rodriguez. It's really a pleasure to be here tonight to uh, talk to you about a, an initiative that I believe was going to be something that is gonna be very helpful for our students. Uh, across the county. I'd like to share with you put this control out, um, a little bit about the current data landscape and a proposal to be able to create a countywide data system that would allow us to track students and keep information to better provide services to them from uh, birth until through, a, uh, through their career. The current data landscape is very fragmented. Students that come to us at kindergarten, at Kinder Roundup, we have very little information about them before they come to us. And in fact, most of that information is gathered through the conversation that we have with parents. And in some cases, of course, if they, they've attended our preschools, then we would have some information. But a lot of times that information is incomplete. When we look at a student that uh, moves across districts or uh, when we look at students who've, who have had a, any kind of interruption to their, to their schooling, there could be a fragmentation to the information that we have about, about uh, the services that they've received and the, the, the needs that they have. 
there's currently a effort by the governor to uh, create a birth through career uh, a data system that would better track the information about the students and their needs. Um, but that's something that's going to take very a long, long time. In fact, the, the governor only set aside $10 million for the whole state, and we think that that's going to be inadequate and not, not result in, in a system that will be uh, usable in, in the foreseeable future. Um, currently, there's about 20 counties across the state that are implementing a countywide data system that would collect information uh, not only from one district, not only from one source, but from multiple sources in a centralized uh, uh, mechanism. The fragmentation of the data is, could be reflected in this image just of, of these different silos that exist and the different kinds of information that exists in these different silos. The zero to five world is separated from the K-12 world and in some cases separated from the post-secondary world. Uh, we have these different databases and your staff, our staff have access to these different pieces of information, but they're usually gathered separately and there is a time uh, constraint, a limitation of us being able to make that information usable. And so it takes a lot of staff time to be able to answer questions that link information for students, for example, of how well they're doing in the third grade and where, whether they enter college, complete college, for example. And so having a single system that connects all of these silos into a single uh, structure is what we're proposing. I'd like to share with you that we already share a lot of data. And a lot of different people are involved in supporting students. We all want to wrap our students with support. And part of that ability to provide support is to be able to share information with each other. You'll see that in this example of all these different, dif different circles, when we have a multidisciplinary team meeting, for example, which many, many, many times happens in PBUSD, you'll have different agencies represented talking about the needs of students. And information is shared between these different agencies. When it comes to working with county services, for example, uh, behavioral health services, information is communicated when there is a student who has high acuity needs and, and there's information communicated between the counselor to, to the county to make sure that those services take place. When a student goes into, on an interdistrict transfer, information is shared. Um, students who are participating in regional programs, such as with the County Office of Education, again, information is shared. We share information with the state through CalPADS, and of course, you have memorandums of understanding sharing information with all your, th your, th your software providers. So when uh, you're using uh, your student information system, whether it's uh, you're using Illuminate or, or, um, or the new information system, Synergy, um, you have you actually have memorandums of understanding with them to make sure that that data is not goes that they have access to it, but they don't share with anybody else. Privacy is probably the single most important concern when we come to a school district and ask for their support in being able to share information, and 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 it is absolutely important to us. We want to make sure that whatever solution we're talking about, we're protecting the privacy of our students and that we're not in any way risking uh, that that information we're, are, is getting out. These data sharing agreements between agencies ensure that whoever, in this case, the County Office of Education, is, is holding to the same standards, whether it's FERPA or, or HIPAA or any other of the, of the requirements that protect student privacy. It's basically a trusted agency that is ensuring the protection of that information. Now, we currently have a, a, a project going on with, uh, with uh, First Five, and it's called the Gateway Program. Uh, with the Gateway Program, when a child is, is born, uh, parents are contacted and they receive a lot of information about about uh, services that are available to them. They uh, were launching a, a program with Community Bridges. Um, um, I'm sorry, oh, I'm forgetting the name of the program. But it's a, it's a, uh, a program that allows uh, for students to get a, uh, a bank account for college. And um, I'm sorry? Semillitas. Semillitas, that's the name of the program. Thank you, Paco. Semillitas. Yes. And so um, with, through that program, we're also asking parents if they would like us, if they will allow us to be able to, to collect information about them, about their children, to be able to provide these additional services. And this program is starting, um, we're starting this program actually next month. And we're excited because every single student in, born in Santa Cruz County is going to be receiving these additional services and is going to be participating in making in this informed consent. This idea of cradle to career, birth to career, 
data sharing is not a new idea and it's, it's happening all over the state and it's something that I think is important for us to have because we'd be able to better understand the needs of our students and be better be able to provide services to them. Now, the district can choose different ways of participating in this program. You have currently data sharing agreements with these different uh, software providers, for example, that make sure that, again, the protection of information is kept. School districts, in some cases, uh, choose to have an opt-in approach for parents to opt into uh, this kind of data sharing or an opt-out approach. And that is something that the different districts have, uh, have taken on differently. What we're proposing is a countywide cradle to career system that would unify the different silos, the data silos that exist. And on top of that, we would have dashboards and reporting that would allow you to answer key questions that would link that information. Let's say, uh, understanding which are the which are the preschool programs that are having the best impact on reading level reading scores in the third grade or which are the kinds of programs and services that are are going to provide the best services for students to be successful in graduation or going on to college or being successful in college this connection this data landscape would be unified in a single system and that's what we're proposing the benefits of this is that having a single uh, information system would allow us to be able to better serve students. We would have better information about an individual student and we would have better information about our groups of students. We would have localized, custom, customized dashboards. So you would be able to, your staff would be able to develop your own dashboards. The login uh, of the system would be PVSDs. Um, any sh information that's being shared would be controlled by the board and by the superintendent. It would result in better um, improved decision making. It not only helps understanding the need of an individual student, because you would have a wider range of information about an individual student, um, and that means better services for that student. But it would also mean you would have a wider range of information about groups of students, which would allow for better decision making about understanding patterns and trends of our students. So we're talking about dashboards, giving you analytics about groups of students, your staff would be able to click and find lists of students and from that be able to look at and learn about in the needs of individual students and services that we're providing to them. So the County Office of Education partnered with the Santa Clara County Office of Education. They have a system called Data Zone and we went through a process to find the best system that was going to provide the best services for students. The system um, exists now in over 36 districts in Santa Clara County and several districts in San Mateo County. Um, it's housed at the Santa Clara County Office of Education. And there is a cost, a cost of uh, between three and four dollars uh, for the implementation of that system. Now the data privacy agreements um, have already been in place for a long time. They've been reviewed by, by several law firms in different school districts and, um, and have been, and there hasn't been at this point in any kind of uh, uh, questioning of those of the the quality or the or the the protections for parents to have about their about their uh, the privacy. What we're proposing is to be able to um, imp make an implementation. Oh my gosh! Yeah. All right, uh, we would cover the costs for the implementation uh, this year or next, and you would consider in 2021, 2022, picking up the cost of implementation. So the County Office of Education would basically seed the program funding for, the, for this year or next, and then you would have the, uh, the decision if you'd want to continue picking up the cost for the future. Um, we would hope this year to secure a data sharing agreement. We provided a copy um, in your backup. Um, uh, we would set up the connection to those data sources, and, um, and all this, these costs are, are, are covered. And then um, we would provide some training in, on the system next year. Uh, and people, this is not to replace your student information system. This is in addition to your student information system. But it would have that wider amount of information than what you currently have. And it would allow you for, um, I believe that the, the kinds of questions you'd be able to answer are going to be very powerful. And I think they would, over time, you would have a very rich amount of information that would allow uh, uh, different service providers that you decide who you want to share information with would be able to provide better services and you would get uh, better information to make decisions to help you with the decisions that you have to make every day. Do you have any questions? 
before we get there, um, are there any public speakers to this discussion item? No, there are not. Okay. Um, any questions, comments from the board? Trustee Shock. So you mentioned, I know that um, I've gotten questions from parents before about the privacy of mm -hmm. information sharing, and there were some problems um, early, or I should say late last year, um, with certain school districts sharing private information with the press um, mm -hmm. that went out. Um, I would support something like this, but I think it would be really important for parents to be able to, like you said, opt in or out of sharing their data about their children. I know that um, parents have expressed concerns that they're feeling their ch feelings of their children being tracked or feelings of things not being secure. So um, I would really want to know more about their data encryption and mm -hmm. the process that they are doing to really keep all of these records safe. Trustee Hull. So echoing in on the privacy, because mm -hmm. I've heard you know, it's definitely, you know, it's a concern for a lot of people. Did I hear you mention that there was a forum? Or, or, or I didn't quite catch that. Or, or is a there forum. For, for parents, or, or was there some kind of community outreach, or is that? Um, that no, that, but that could be oh. something that we could organize if that's something that you would like to, to, uh, to, for us to be able to help provide. Right, just so, it, so that there's some way to, you know, some kind of a community outreach so that there is communication about how mm -hmm. privacy is protected. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Thank you. Question? Trustee DeSerpa. Thank, thank you. Second time I've seen this presentation. Um, so, so you talk about that it's, it's useful, and mm -hmm. you talk about services, but that is very abstract. Like the mm -hmm. general person watching this on TV and community TV is not going to know what that means, and I'm actually unsure also. Okay. Because we're pretty good at data in our district already. We mm -hmm. know what the issues are. Pretty seriously, we have um, teachers that get release time to talk about the kids that are already in trouble that we can see or that need some remediation or need mm -hmm. extra help. So, can you clearly explain like the need for that? Why, yeah, the need and how it's going to help the districts and the students. So, I think that's a great question. So, the first the first thing I'd like to point out is that um, whenever you have a question about uh, understanding, for example, how many of our students who took uh, an AP um, math class, how well they did in college, for example. Um, or so, for example, let, let's, let's go with that example. So a, a student took the calculus class and we wanted to see how well the students in calculus did at Carrillo College when they transferred over. Um, to get that question, at this point you probably couldn't get that answer um, because we don't have a lot of information being shared between the uh, Cabrillo College and, and the K-12 system. In some cases, there is, uh, there, there are some, uh, inf some information is shared where this, w without any student identifiable information. The Cabrillo College is wanting to partner with us on this, and so we would be able to answer questions like that that can't be answered right now because we'd be able to share information with Cabrillo College to be better understand the connection between K-12 and Cabrillo, for example. The amount of, when you ask a question of staff, they have to pull information from these different data sources and they have to reconcile that information. So if, they, if, if they're using the clearinghouse data to find out where students ended up, they have to get that information from clearinghouse, they have to pull the information from the high school and they have to try to get those connections between those to understand how this one student and their experience led to their success or lack of success going to college. That extra work would be solved because there would be a single system that would connect all of those systems in one place. So you wouldn't, it would take a lot less work on staff to be able to generate that kind of information. And in some cases, like with the example of Cabrillo College, you would have new information that you don't have access to at this point. So imagine just from a, from a data point of view, understanding if you're wanting to understand the need of a specific student. And imagine if all you had more information about the kinds of services and the kinds of experiences a student have. For example, if they had uh, special needs that were identified when they were two years old, and being able to have that information the, because uh, when they come into a kindergarten and how useful that would be for you to have that information in real time for your students. Now with, with special education, that some of that information already exists, but there's other kinds of information, other kinds of services. Let's say the student had some, some reading challenges and, and, and required some, uh, some additional support that they needed, you would have that information upon enrollment in kindergarten. 
So the kinds of things that we would be able to do, understanding the needs of students earlier on and later, and being able to collect all that information in one place would allow for a better understanding of, of the needs of students. Um, and I could give you other examples of, of what that would look like. I guess if we knew some of these things, what would be different about targeting resources to s certain groups? Is that what the so, districts could potentially do? And could so, you give an example of that? Well, so, so the Cabrillo College, let's say we recognize that students who participate in the AP classes are not as successful in going to, in their math classes at Cabrillo College as students who participate in the Math Academy, for example. And you'd be able to recognize that the Math Academy is a more successful program at preparing students for their success at, at the community college. That would give you some very meaningful data that you could then say, let's expand this program, um, or let's take a look at our AP classes and find out why they're not having the same results. Just letting you know that we're at our five minute discussion. Yeah. I guess, um, I, I guess you know, data d is a tool like any other tool. Um, in my own experience in my family, I had a kid who got who passed every AP class he ever went through and is now not as successful in college because I feel like he was worked so hard in such a rigorous program that he burned out and not doing well. So I think sometimes those markers, those successes are not um, are not sometimes good indicators. So I, I don't know. I think it's a complicated issue. And I'm hoping that to, I'm offering a solution that I think would, would help simplify that, the information that you would have to make decisions about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ferris, and uh, thank you for representing Walt Simon the County. Uh, <laughs> are we voting on this? Are we voting on this? No, no. no. Or, or yeah. not, okay. So next up, agenda item. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, agenda item 9.2, resolution of support of schools and local communities funding act of 2020. Sorry, 8.3 CTE program update presentation. The report will be presented by Julie Edwards. I am not Julie Edwards, but I will be presenting with Julie Edwards. Uh, good evening, uh, Board of Trustees, President Dodge, Dr. Rodriguez. A uh, few exciting pieces to be going on with our CTE program that we wanted to make sure that we brought forward today uh, to really show you the momentum that's happened. Uh, and some of the next steps that we have going on and uh, give Julie a, a crack at being able to speak with all of you guys too in regards to the positive work that's been happening. So in a few pieces that have occurred, so in the transition period from county office CTE to PVUSD, we really looked at three major elements. We looked at exploring what the 12 elements of really high quality CTE programming would be. Those are actually right in front of you as well. So the board received a reference guide this evening. Uh, in the second page, it actually identifies all of those high-end quality pieces that we're looking for. It runs over 12 elements and 92 different criteria. Um, I'm gonna explain a few of those pieces and what the results are of what we've seen so far in assessing the programs. Also look at really envisioning and going through the grant writing process gave us an opportunity to relook at the labor market demands, gave us an opportunity to relook at what the state has approved uh, for other districts as well, and really what the trends of CTE have been uh, to give us our best shot and our best opportunities to be able to solidify grant funding through the state. The other piece that we worked diligently on since that time period was to really engage and look at what are the focus areas that we need to go to, very similar to what we would have done with a curriculum program if this was any other content area. A um, Little bit more diverse because of the number of classes and pathways that we have, but no more uh, important than to actually kind of dig a little deeper and say, are we hitting those high quality factors? How do we know that? How are we measuring that? And then really looking at what are the new learnings around that that we may have access to within our own network and then outside of that network. So this is actually referencing within that first page of your reference guide. We know you're not gonna read this all this evening, <laughs> but definitely an opportunity for you to be able to see all of the groundwork that goes into really performing and doing high quality programs. In that piece, it breaks down by standard what each one of those 12 elements are and then the 92 criteria that fall underneath each of them. You guys have heard me present on PBIS before. 
this is very similar in nature. So what you're seeing is when we talk about those tiered fidelity inventories of looking at those 15 factors underneath tier one and so on, this is identical to that. What it really do is it, what it really does is mirror what are those levels of support that you need to run a high quality program. The data that you're seeing up here is our first survey. This is a year long survey that we basically will be going back out to our staff to ask. Uh, we had a tremendous amount of support from our CTE teachers. So what we do is we look at the perception of those teaching the courses. We also do walkthroughs and observations. We also work with a partnership group that goes through with us and looks at the scope and sequence. So when I refer to that scope and sequence, it's looking at a pathway. We need at least two of those classes together to be a pathway. We're searching really to make sure that the high quality piece would be three classes. So you'd have an introduction course, you'd have a concentration course, and then a capstone course. So that's really what the, the district is moving forward with in terms of that high quality need that we have and really assessing, do we have that currently and what should the scope and sequence look like? So this is a combination of factors. The pieces in blue, which we're gonna speak to again this evening, is gonna be the, the pieces that we've identified that between the teacher survey, the walkthrough analysis and observations, and the assessment of really looking at what those labor market demands are and where we may be a little soft on training or professional development, these are the areas that we're going after. Not really a new concept. We've actually gone uh, back to anchoring the uh, six key strategies of change that we've used in other elements. We've used this in the equity audit as well to help frame the work. Um, but it really takes a look at when you're doing project management, how do you kind of chunk off that elephant piece to get us to a place of saying, let's go for those high priority pieces first that we can all agree to and then move forward from there. And how are we articulating that and communicating that to the teachers, our stakeholders, the business partnerships that we need? What we looked at is those six key factors there. The first two are in alignment with what we're doing across the district. So when we talk about looking at standards aligned curriculum, what curriculum was being used, is it standards aligned, is it highly rigorous? The other piece that we look at is engaging instruction. Are we capturing the attention of our students? Is it a course that they want to take? Is it viable that we're going to have repeated courses that when you take your first intro class, you're going to want to come back and take your second class? So those two pieces are not unique just to CTE. They're things that we're doing across the board with all of our classes. The other uh, pieces, which one is, is very much so self-evident, which is the facilities, the technology, the infrastructure that we need to run high quality programs. And Julie will speak a little bit about that with the signature pathways. Um, Work-based learning experience. So this is where the industry meets our kids. What, are the what do the internships look like for our kids? How do we partner them with Kaiser if they're in the medical industry? How do we partner them with Driscoll's if we're going into ag? So it's those building of the partnerships really and that interface that they will have with their first experience with industry. That said, in order to get to that work-based learning, we have to have the connection of the business and community partnerships. So that also is an area of focus that we've identified by going through these pieces. And then the last one is really looking at, and we, we're full of acronyms in education, so it's uh, the CTSOs, which is probably the most infamous that you guys may recognize is FFA, um, Skills USA, uh, Business America. Uh, these pieces really look at, uh, for lack of better terms, I'll reference them as what they've referred to in the past as soft skills, but we're finding more and more students that don't really have those going into our, our, our industry. Those soft skills include how to make decisions, how you communicate effectively with other adults, um, what that looks like to have integrity when you're in a position. So some of the things and conversations that we sometimes leave, leave out of the education piece on CTE um, is really bolstered by looking at what CTSO positions can we put our folks into um, and really get our kids a sense of those soft skills that they need to be productive not just the skill base and the technical aspect, but really a well-rounded student that's able to go into an industry and be successful immediately. And I'm gonna pass it off to Julie so that she can give you a little bit more about how we're gonna get there and how we're gonna get it done. Thank you, Chris. It's really fun to be here tonight and I'm excited the last time that I spoke with you it was many months ago, right when we were getting started after we transitioned our program um, back to the district. So I, first want to um, bring your attention to the next slide, which is about funding. And I just have the little, like, I like to have the light aspect with funding matters. And these are, it does matter for CTE. CTE is a, a program that um, 
is rich in resources, some consumables, some infrastructure resources, and so it's a program that we need to pay attention to um, very closely from a financial standpoint. Excuse me. Um, recently, I've worked with Andrea Willey, our amazing grant writer, and our industry partners and collaborators to finish two large grants. And I've, I've told Chris that writing those two grants over the six or eight weeks that it took was the best professional development for me as the new CTE coordinator that I could, there's no conference where I could have learned what I learned in that process, both about our program and the needs and our teachers and what they need, but also um, first and foremost our kids. So I wanted to share with you just real quick, um, the acronym at the top there is CTIG and that stands for Career Technical Education Incentive Grant. State of California has committed a huge amount of money to an ongoing source for CTE funding. We, um, the prior year, the 18-19 year, we applied and were awarded $279,000. And then this year, we submitted our application. Andrea and I drove it up to the Department of Ed where I've never been and it was like going to the mountain. Um, but there was a huge CTE display in the lobby and I felt like it was super validating to see that. I took a picture of the person accepting the grant from us because I wanted proof that they got it. Um, anyway, we applied for that and we've been casually notified that we've been um, recommended for $493,000. Not quite what we asked for, but darn close. Super excited. And we will be in the future down there, you'll see, we're applying for the next round of CTIG um, actually next month. So before the end of this school year, we'll know we, what for sure what we got for this year and what's for next year. So we'll have a nice big chunk of money to start doing all of this work. Um, K-12 Strong Workforce is another state program that is the one that is highly, highly connected to the community college. So in partnership with Cabrillo, we um, did, we proposed um, $777,000 in work that will support curriculum and instruction that helps to link to Cabrillo, as well as um, measures that we can put in place for post-secondary success. Um, that was the focus of our Strong Workforce application. We are also in partnership with ETR um, for an NSF, National Science Foundation grant, which I'm sure you're probably familiar with. This is year two. We were awarded $90,000 over three years. It's a focus on cybersecurity, also linking with Cabrillo College, and we have a state-of-the-art classroom at PV High now. We have really exciting things happening in the fall with that pathway, and a really, um, we're going to be having a, an, a, a parent night on February 5th for our parents to understand the different um, options that their kids have within the information and communication technology arena to help their students make a decision about whether they're gonna pursue computer networking or programming, because we're gonna have both pathways at PV High. Um, and then Perkins is the money that we get based on a formula that is, that is federal money, and it's formulaic in terms of the number of students that complete CTE pathways and a variety of other factors. This last year, our, our allocation was $154,000. Uh, um, and then, pardon me? Four minutes, okay, I'll hurry. Um, so CTIG will go on, we've been told, for approximately another eight to 10 years. We will apply each year. And we, sh we show progress as we go, and, that, and then we sh uh, show the areas of need, and that's how we um, identify what we ask for funding. Um, LCAP, the LCAP, which we're all very familiar with, is another source of funding for CTE programs. And um, as I mentioned, subsequent year CTIG and Strong Workforce, Strong Workforce will persist as well, and then additional Perkins through the years. So um, very quickly, and this other handout that you had with the, the reference guide that you were um, provided, this is a, um, a final draft of a quote-unquote one-pager. It's actually a two-pager because it's got a back side. It's and a one it's a one-sheeter. Yes, it's one-sheeter. OK, very good. And this is kind of in a nutshell what the signature pathway reflects. And again, it's a final draft. It's still going to be passed under the noses of some more people before it's finalized. But it is basically, if you recall, last spring, the schools were asked to 
identify a pathway based on um, student interest and labor market demand and relevancy to our community. And each comprehensive high school and Renaissance High came up with an area of focus. So the front talks about the generalities around signature pathways. And the back of this sheet has a column for each of the signature pathways. So the first one you'll see is sustainable agriculture, and it's in orange on the left. And there's a lot of detail about it, which I'm not going to go into. Happy to answer questions anytime. But I wanted to share with you that the, the granular details around signature pathways are on the back. But before I jump into signature pathways, I'm going to go back a step and just say that we are working with New School, our community day school on programming. Their students are attending classes at Digital Nest every Friday. They are remodeling their kitchen and anticipate doing some culinary ex uh, CTE exploration. And they are also um, working with a, an organization that has to do with installing mosaics in Watsonville. So the students are going to be learning some of the craft, uh, the art and craft of mosaic um, installation. And um, we're evaluating the facility for additional CTE exploratory experiences. In addition, our CTE counselor, Sandy Solis, is, is um, visiting a uh, new school to help do some of the Naviance curriculum instruction there and support the students there that way. Renaissance High School, their signature pathway is in development. They are, it's highly likely it will be visual and commercial art. Um, if that doesn't gel, then it will likely be sustainable agriculture. We're working on that facility as well and um, working closely with Deanna, the principal, on getting that rolled out so that it's it's going to happen in the fall. Next, Watsonville High, you can see, um, again, the details on the, the one-sheeter, but the core sequence is for, sus for sustainable agriculture is um, freshman biology leads to sustainable ag, ag chem, and then ag systems, and then a dual enrolled course with Cabrillo College. And we're looking at um, articulation, which is where students earn concurrent credit if they earn a B or better in the course, so they are then um, able to earn the Cabrillo credits as well, as well. Whereas dual enrolled is a potentially a Cabrillo instructor on campus teaching during the school day or at Cabrillo College, and the students are actually earning college credit. So, so I don't want to take up the time, but just go back one slide really quick. I want to yeah, show you something. So when I speak to high schoolers and I ask them, what, how can I change education your high school to fit you they often say to me let me learn what I want to learn right so this is a version of that so I want you to focus on the ninth and tenth grade really quick they have to take biology per well they have to take two years of lab they don't have to take biology but generally they take biology and chemistry what this allows them to do is to say I want to go into sustainable ag I have to take biology anyway so instead of regular biology I'm going to take sustainable ag a biological approach or instead of taking chemistry because I have to take chemistry no matter what I'm going to take agricultural chemistry. So the, the beauty of CTE pathways is not just the fact that at I, my electives become these classes, but it's also that my core classes are directed towards my passions, interests, and talents. So I just wanted to highlight that. Thanks. Exactly. Thank you. And on the back, you can see toward the bottom, you can see the college majors that connect to the signature pathways as well as some occupations. Just a sampling. There's a, a million occupations. But so then at PB High, that's a bright green, um, th uh, there are 90 students right now at PB High that have already started the signature pathway. And they're in, in um, what's called IT Essentials, which is an articulated career course. Next year, they will, this is what I referred to the parent night, where parents are actually going to have the choice of helping their student decide between networking or programming. The signature pathway is programming, but networking is going to be offered as a dual enrolled course on campus during the school day, which is really exciting. And then an advanced programming class in 11th grade, and then dual enrollment options beyond um, in the computer science pathway connection at Cabrillo. And then lastly, Aptos High, their biotechnology pathway will um, have its inaugural year this coming fall. 
And the core sequence there is similar to what Dr. Rodriguez said for sustainable ag in that biology is the technology of biology. Chemistry is applied chemistry and bio, uh, yeah, applied chemistry and biochemistry. A science and ethics of biotech, which is articulated, and, and then a dual enrollment course after that. Um, this is a, uh, a set of courses that were written um, through an initiative through the UC called UCCI, University of California Curriculum Institute. It's a very high-end, intentional CTE pathway that um, is a very well-respected sort of series. And we were able to get Cabrillo to approve it for articulation, which is really cool. So out of the gate, it's like checking all the boxes. It's also being scheduled after lunch so that students from other campuses can access this course, which is another aspect of signature pathways that we are working toward for all the signatures. So the idea is that kids can move between campuses once we um, deal with some logistical things around schedules, et cetera, but transportation is in place. Um, we're already experimenting with dual enrollment at Aptos High, and buses are gonna start taking kids to Aptos High for medical terminology next week and kids from Aptos High down to Watsonville to take graphic an advanced graphic design class. So we're um, working with transportation and they've been just awesome. So, yeah. I should be quiet now? Okay. Okay. <laughs> right, thank you. Um, are there any public speakers to this discussion item? Any questions or comments from the board? Trustee, did you want to? So, um, do we have any, I mean, there's, I see the biotechnology yeah. pathway. Is there another one for other medical careers? Um, there are, so the, these are the signatures. Right. And then there are many other pathways. Okay. And there is a patient care pathway at both Watsonville High and PV High. Okay. And kids from Aptos, because there used to be the classes at Aptos. So Correct. Those are, have gone away now? Or? That class, that class, the teacher retired last year. Mm -hmm. And biotech was the next priority. Okay. So, so um, there's a shortage of nurses mm -hmm. nationwide and doctors. 50% um, of our doctors are being trained outside of the United States now. Um, Dominican Hospital has the oldest bargained contract for nurses in the nation. They were the very first bargained contract, and I am also very proudly represented by SEIU. Mm -hmm. It's a great career path yeah. to go into nursing because mm -hmm. you start out at $60 an hour if you're a brand new nurse at Dominican. So I really would like to see a better, more robust pathway for the medical profession. And I know you meant to say partner with Dignity Health and not with Kaiser, right? How about Since I'm all medical providers in Santa Health. Cruz County? I lost my like competitor. Ago. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. that's what I have to say. And I'm very yeah. pleased with the work that you're doing. And you're so excited about it and Thanks. passionate. And I can't wait to see all the wonderful things that happen for Thank the kids you. in this community. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Trustee Holm. Yeah. I was really pleased to see that ethics was a component mm -hmm. of, you know, particularly with the, the biotech program. And how do we foster those critical thinking skills, like, and the, the soft skills that you've touched on, but like how, you know, how are you seeing those in some of the other programs? Mm -hmm. um, through the career um, curriculum component, dis ethical decision making is something that, or just decision making in general. Um, it's a life skill, obviously, is something that is covered um, through the, I would say, gently through the Naviance adoption, as well as heavily in our social studies programs in high school. Um, so yeah, in health as well. Yeah. All right. A couple of other pieces. So one of the areas that you saw in that 12 elevated factors was looking at CTSOs. So a huge piece of, of that missing link and what we've notified and looked at through our teachers as well as us is that those organizations, robust FFAs, because that's something that's been traditional and been going on, but there are other areas that we can explore and look at, which would not be selective to a specific signature, but actually attract multiple pathways, whether it's signature or not. So signature or not, similar to Skills USA, um, those pieces that doesn't matter which pathway you're in, it's giving you those additional skills base as well. Runs a little bit more like club base, if you will, but the gravity of when you get leverage in pathways is that kids flock to those two because they identify with other kids that are in pathways too. So that will be another area that we look at to, to make sure that we have focus on. Mm -hmm. Trustee Ruskell. Thank you. So I, I one comment 
and then I'll follow up with my questions. Um, um, I'm really happy um, you included New School and Renaissance. And so my question um, is, is the goal is for these schools also to have pathways that mirror that in our three comprehensive high schools? So the goal is for Renaissance to have a full-fledged pathway that leads to it. Uh, new school is a little bit different. So when you're running a community day school, the, the goal is really not to, one, mm -hmm. keep our kids there. So we're trying to actually move our kids back. Uh, what we do find is that with Renaissance, they have a little bit more robust ability to be able to hold a pathway. And we have kids that spend a little longer out there with credit recovery. Um, the goal really is, though, as you can see with some of those pieces, whether it's visual and commercial, whether it's ag, that actually would lead back and offer our kids an opportunity to still be a part of the pathways at Watsonville High, still could be a pathway at PV High, so that if they choose to move back to one of the comprehensive schools that has that program as well, they wouldn't also lose traction or ground. Um, what you're seeing and what, what Julie referenced with New School, and she, uh, if you heard her articulate it, it was that exploration piece. What we're really trying to do is get kids excited. They do have a very strong movement with their civics piece, uh, but really it's the place of going we want to be able to move our kids back to our comprehensives whenever possible. Um, so it really is not a designed program to keep kids there for a multiple year pathway piece. Okay. And my other question is, um, I mean, it is a goal to have every student in the district do college and career ready upon graduation. So I'm assuming that the courses on, uh, at least for the three comprehensive high schools, I'm assuming those courses are UC, A through G approved? Everything. Everything yeah. is. At, Mo at Aptos High, they're all A through G. PV High, I believe they are as well. Watsonville, there might be a couple that are being applied for, but the goal is to have 100% A through G in the CTE courses. Great, yeah. thank you. And then my last question is, um, do uh, students, will students be walking um, out with certifications from any of these pathways? Yes, they will. Yay. Different Different levels and with the computing, program, they, they achieve certain levels that lead them toward certification as they go along the way. Some of them, they'll walk away with something in their hand. As that, the back of that one sheeter breaks down some of the options that we currently have that, that are going forward, but absolutely with the intent to make sure that our kids are certified and have a usable piece when they leave us. That's Take wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Trustee Schachter. Maria asked one of my questions, so thank you. <laughs> I want somebody to ask me that now. My other question was, I know you mentioned in the Microphone. Oh. I know you mentioned in the very beginning um, about creating, you're trying to create more community partnerships to move forward with the CTE. What are we doing to create those partnerships and what can we help you with to create those partnerships? We're, we are working with, Your Future is Our Business is our partner that is helping with that piece. All of our teachers are, um, meant to be connected with an industry partner themselves. And so where a teacher doesn't have a partnership, your future is our business is helping and then we're, we're networking. Um, what can you do to help? I would love to talk with you more about that because we need, we need that support. That is the critical piece, the linkage between the um, theoretical hands-on practice and skill attainment and the community and workplace experiences, so yeah. Another area, and I'll, I'll just kind of throw that out there as well, is we will be bringing a board policy piece uh, forward as well. It actually looks at training. So right now our training and our board policy reflects uh, really in-house training because that's what we've done in the past. But this actually requires us to, to hook up our teachers with industry partners, which means they'll need to train off-site and off-district facilities at times. Uh, so you, you, you will see that come through as well. So we'd appreciate your support when that comes through. That will help definitely. Students will actually go out, I don't know if they're in culinary, they, they might go out to some, I don't know, some big huge hotel where they do some fancy culinary and whatever, I don't know, um, or, <laughs> or um, egg, I mean, obviously we have Driscoll, but I mean, um, but there's other, so there's ways that we connect out there, we go out there with these students to these places where they can connect, I mean, I don't know, with graphic artists or whatever, I don't know, um, in, in out there in the community that they will go. 
Yeah, so that is uh, the other focus area that you saw up there, which was that work-based learning experience. Uh, specific model that we've had in place at the district in connection with the city was Summer in the City. That's very mirroring of us connecting the dots between our kids, those internships, and really getting that quality experience with um, different, uh, different industries, depending on what that looks like. But that absolutely is the intent of work-based experiences, that they'll have direct contact with partners. Um, and essentially, you now have a certification when you leave us, and, and it is not uncommon for kids to receive job offers after the fact either when you have a full, flourished pathway. I would think so. Yeah, I would think so. Sounds good. Just one quick question. Um, you were talking about between Cabrillo and Aptos High School. Like, how is that going to work? Are they going to take, like, the metro bus system, or is there buses? Um, it's our transportation. Yeah, our buses. Okay. Yeah, our buses are going there. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Res oh, here, resolution nine point. I mean, night agenda item nine point two. Resolution nineteen dash twenty dash twenty five. Support of schools and local communities funding act of twenty twenty, and it says report will be made by Maria Rusco. Yes, and I would actually like to ask Nelly to come up uh, in case you have something else to add. So um, this resolution is in support of the California Schools and Local Communities Funding Act of 2020. Um, so just a little bit of what this initiative would do if it were to pass come November. It will reclaim over $12 billion per year for K-12 schools, community colleges, and local communities. It closes a commercial property tax loopholes and ends shady schemes that big corporations and wealthy investors use to avoid paying their fair share of property taxes. It protects all homeowners and renters by maintaining tax protections for all residential property. It invests in educating all of our kids and in the vital services necessary to support our families and communities. It provides one of the largest tax incentives in a, in a generation to spur new investment in small businesses and it levels the playing field for all the, all the businesses that already pay their fair share. And lastly, it ensures a strict accountability so that money goes directly towards students and communities. Um, so this resolution before you um, supports all of that. And so tonight, Nellie and I, and everyone else involved, because there's been so many stakeholders involved in, in getting this uh, measure part of the ballot this November, would like to ask for the board to move this forward. And if there's anything else you would like to add? Thank you. Um, and then tonight I also um, was able to attend a, a portion of the CSEA chapter meeting and their area rep was there as well to, to speak in support of schools and communities first. So I know that CSEA members are also on board because, I mean, it makes sense. <laughs> it makes absolute sense to fund our schools and to also um, fund our communities because it's not it's kind of like a big wraparound uh, service boost um, financial service boost for our communities and our schools so thank you for for accepting this resolution and, and presenting it and just one last thing that trustee Shocker wants me to emphasize mm -hmm. is that it's uh, there will be no property, no changes to to property taxes for homeowners. Yeah, and there is going to be a lot of money invested by, you know, the big, the you know, large, uh, well, very wealthy people uh, who are going to put in a lot of money to Stop mislead, mm -hmm. yeah. to mislead, yeah. misinform um, the voting constituents. So. Um, no, it's not going to affect your property taxes. It's not going to affect renters. Um, it is going to hold these major, um, majorly wealthy people who can afford it Corporate. to actually pay their fair share mm -hmm. in their property taxes. And mm -hmm. one last thing, because I remember this from our discussion was, um, <laughs> we live in an area where agriculture is a big part mm -hmm. of our community. Absolutely. So this does not apply to ag land no it does not this um so ag is is um is safe from that then they won't be affected and um and then there's an incentives that will hopefully happen from this and that would be that some of these wealthy people who have um, properties that 
have maybe just been sitting there, it might incentivize them to build and create housing. So, so any public speakers to this item? Um, any more discussion from the board? Uh, oh, Trustee Holm, did you want to say something? One, I enthusiastically support this. It's I, I've had you know many conversations over the past few years with our state legislate state legislators and just how we need avenues for increasing our funding to our schools. There's more needed, of course, but this is a step in the right direction, mm -hmm. and we desperately need to take it. Absolutely. Can I get a motion? I would like to make a motion to approve this resolution. Is there a second? Second. Right. I'll second. Can I go ahead and get a vote? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So um, just to um, add or just emphasize, I would really love to see PVFT, PV, PVFTs, PVUSDs, Board of Trustees sign the online um, form of the online on the website, the schools and communities um, first and just to show that support. And so your name is on the website. That okay. would be wonderful. And if we Thank read you. the resolution, that's actually an action item that we're all committing to. Oh, as part so of you're resolution. gonna do it. So we have <laughs> to. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Exactly, we're gonna do it. Okay, so uh, agenda item 9.3, approve resolution dash 19, 19-20-23, uh, acknowledging National School Week, report will be presented, well, Tona's not here, <laughs> but the, yeah, We've tried okay. twice now. <laughs> uh, so I have the pleasure and, and honor of, of moving forward with this resolution in front of you this evening. Um, as you know, National School Counseling Week is coming up February 3rd through the 7th. Uh, in front of you is a resolution. A couple of highlights in that resolution. Uh, whereas school counselors are actively committed to helping our students explore their abilities, strengths, interests, and talents as these traits relate to career well awareness and development. Also, whereas our school counselors seek to identify and utilize those community resources that enhance and complement our comprehensive uh, school counseling programs and help students become productive members of society. Um, we can't say enough how much our counselors have helped move forward our students' health uh, and really the dynamic piece that they play in the social emotional supports that we have for our kids. Um, it is staff's recommendation this evening that we approve the resolution and proclamation that February 3rd through the 7th would be National School Counselors Week in recognition. Thank you. Any public speakers to the item? No. Any discussion from the board? No, we're happy to do it. Can, we, can I have a motion? I'll make a motion. No, can I have a second? I'll second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Next up, agenda item 9.4, approve resolution number 19-20-22, support of Black History Month. Black History. Oops, you got to turn it on. It's got to be turned on. And she'll have you turn it on, too. Good evening, President Dodge, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Um, Rodriguez. You can pull it up there. there, you there you thank go. you. you don't have to I know I'm a little yeah, taller, leave, right? Yeah. <laughs> I have the privilege of presenting Resolution 1920-22, acknowledging Black History Month. I will be reading highlights from this resolution. Whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District recognizes that Black History Month is the opportunity to promote and foster cultural relevance for our in our schools and enrich the educational experiences of our students to deepen their understanding of the different perspectives of American history. Whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District recognizes the significant contributions and considerable advances that African Americans have made and continue to make in our community, state, and the world. In such areas as education, medicine, art, culture, public service, economics, development, politics, human, and human rights, we see the greatness of America and those who have risen above injustice and enriched our society. Whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District encourages PVUSD educators to celebrate, honor, and study the contributions of the African Americans throughout the year and to include the lived experiences every month. Therefore, be it resolved that the Pajaro Valley Board of Trustees acknowledges that February 2020 as Black History Month 
and recognizes the significance of Black History Month as an important time to acknowledge and celebrate the contributions of African Americans in this nation's history. Therefore, be it resolved that Pajaro Valley Board of Trustees encourages the continued celebration of this month to provide an opportunity for all members of the district to learn more about the past and better understand the experiences that have shaped the, <clears throat> the nation and the world. Passed and adopted this 22, 22nd day of January 2020 by f following vote. There you go. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent Casey. Um, any public speakers to this item? Uh, any discussion from the board? Uh, can I get a motion? Oh, I was just going to say, you know, <laughs> I mean, you just have to recognize how much, for example, African Americans have done in, in regards to human rights, justice and human rights, which, you know, I'm mean, talking about Martin Luther King, but, but, but not only him, so many African Americans and still today are so fighting so hard for, you know, justice and human rights for, for all of us, I would say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there a motion? Make a motion. Second. A second. Um, no, no, call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? <laughs> motion passes. Thank you very much. Next up, agenda item 9.5, 2018-19, out of report. Report will be presented by Joe the CBU. All right, good evening, uh, President Dodge Jr. and members of the board, Superintendent Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Uh, attached in your item you have and uh, the audit report. And if you can turn to my favorite pages, it's page 103, 104, 105, and 106. And all our financial documents for PVSD our auditor has no findings. So that's my favorite part of the report. Uh, and uh, with that being said, we're gonna do a short little summary of how we got there. And uh, Helen will introduce our auditor, Mr. Escobar. Good evening, President Dodge, board members, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, it's my pleasure to present Joe Escobar, Escobar from our audit firm, uh, Ide Bailey, uh, formerly BTD. Um, and we spent with them probably from early spring last year till um, December 15th working on the audit with them. And they've, you know, they've asked us to pull documents to um, have them review and they do an intensive review. And um, I'm very proud that we were able to do it with no findings. So mm -hmm. I, Joe, I'll let you Thank present. You. Um, oh, yeah, sure. Um, Thank you, board. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for allowing me to present for you today. Um, really, the our audit opinion uh, can be summarized uh, in our four different letters. We have uh, four letters. One is a positive opinion. The other three are negative opinions, providing assurance, and the fact that we did not find any uh, have any findings. Um, those are related to state compliance, uh, internal controls, and federal compliance. Whereas the positive assurance uh, states that the financial statements are fairly and reasonably stated in all material respects, and that the opinion is unmodified. <laughs> Any public speakers to this item? Yes. Uh, Bill Beecher? Good evening again. Um, last fall, uh, I came before the board and uh, went through an issue we found with the uh, Citizens Oversight Committee and funds that were transferred out of one account on Measure L to another account back in 2016. Um, over a million dollars was identified. That's not chump change. And so I sent a letter to these folks and ask them to look for any transfers out of Measure L accounts from one to another. I haven't received any response from them. So tonight I ask, did you look and what were the results? If you did not, why not? And in future 
assuming that you're our auditor next year, will you do that in the upcoming audits? If not, what does it take for you to do that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Any more public speakers? No. Okay. Any discussion from the board? Trustee to a question? It's for, um, I don't know his name. What is his name? Escobar? Yes, the auditor. Is his uh, name Escobar? Mr. Escobar? Mr. Escobar? Um, I, I did, we did receive the letter. Uh, we did not respond, uh, that is correct. Um, actually, the uh, letter, uh, I spoke with Helen in regards to it, and um, the contents actually, what the request is, is beyond the scope of our audit. Uh, we're actually uh, contracted by the board uh, to perform um, our audit within governmental audit standards. And the specifics in which the letter we're pertaining to is um, kind of like an inter-transfer uh, level. Um, however, the, the district is uh, providing their own uh, investigation in regards to that, I believe. Okay, so we'll look forward to that later. But I had other questions for you. Sure. Um, so you audit many districts. Yes. How often is there a is there a no findings finding? Like how often does that happen? Um, Co is that common or uncommon? Like I would say I've had auditors in front of me. I've been on the board eleven years, so I've had sure. many auditors in sure. front of me before. So sure. Um, the there was a, fi a finding for Paro. Um, three years ago. It's not in this report because it gets removed after prior year. So, you know, every three years in that case, um, I'm not sure if there was any before that. Um, I would probably, I, I wouldn't throw an estimate, but um, I, I would say it's, it's more common that there are not findings um, for the most part. Um, but there are districts where we have um, 15 findings, <laughs> you know, uh, some that are more troubled, um, whereas... And so when you talk about the word finding, because we have new board members here, sure. what does that mean exactly if you had a finding? It's an irregularity or an area that needs remediation, or what do you mean by a finding? Sure. So a finding would require a response by, dis by the district management, um, which is, that's disclosed in there as well. Um, they're going to be uh, related to it depends on what finding. There could be a state compliance finding. Um, there could be a federal uh, com compliance finding and there could be an internal control deficiency um, uh, or a financial statement um, finding. Uh, those are the, the four categories of findings. Um, a simple compliance finding with, with state could be the instructional time amount that the schools had um, was not meeting the requirement by the state. So it's or something that should be corrected in some way. Yes, yes, right. uh, yeah. Okay. okay. So <laughs> congratulations, Helen and Joe. No finding. Good job. And that's a really long time to do an audit. Is that a normal time from the spring all the way to December? Um, no, I think this one was um, just a little bit uh, longer. Um, uh, we do our audits in three phases. We have an initial planning phase at the beginning of the year. That's what we're doing right now. Uh, then we have the interim phase. We come in April, May, what have you, uh, and then final audit. So it's broken up. Uh, we are not working on it the whole time. It's just more intense periods of time, maybe two weeks at a time, two weeks at a time, two weeks at a time. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for the questions. Uh, can I go ahead and get a motion? Move to approve. Can I second? Second. Um, take a take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much. Next up, item 9.6, school accountability report cards. Report will be presented by Lisa Gina, Assistant Superintendent. But I have a second. Yes. Good evening, Board President Dodge, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, in 1998, Prop, or 1988, Prop 98 was passed, and this was supposed to give um, schools a steady stream of funding, and in return, um, all public schools then were required to annually prepare school accountability report cards called SARCs and disseminate to the public. Um, 
And what, how this happens is that through a system called Doc Tracking System, um, SARCs are updated by the Facilities Department, Human Resources Department, Technology Department, the Curriculum Department, and Finance. Additionally, information is uploaded directly from the state in regards to our state test scores. The majority of the information is from the current year, 2019-20, but there are some, um, some parts of the information within the SARC that is from previous years that is standard on all SARCs. For example, expenditures per pupil and site teacher salaries are from 2017-18, types of services funded from 2018-19 school year, CTE programs and state test scores are also from the 2018-19 school year. So now we'll take a look at what's on the school accountability report card. So there's different, um, the basic components of the SARC, about, about the school, conditions of learning, pupil outcomes, parent student engagement, and then there's some, another category called other SARC information. So within the, about the school, it's the contact information, the basic information about um, who the site principal is, what district that they belong to, a narrative description of the school and the school mission statement, the student enrollment, broken down by demographics. So I'll leave that up for a second. The conditions of learning, and um, if you notice on the side, we have it aligned to our LCAP. So the LCAP is more recent. The SARC is very, the um, archaic document. Um, we're looking at teacher credentials, textbooks and instructional materials, which was reported out earlier this year through our Williams visit, and then also school facilities, which was reported earlier through our Williams visit. Pupil outcomes. This really is taking a look at the state test scores that students take, the CASP test scores, the physical fitness test, which is taken in grades five, seven, and nine, and then the, our career technical education programs, if this does apply to certain schools. Engagement looks at parental involvement and also um, student, student engagement. So it takes a look at um, school suspension, school attendance, it looks at dropout and graduation rates for our high schools. And then it also um, the, it takes a look at the different activities and opportunities that are available for students on the um, school grounds. The other information that is within the SARC um, looks at class size, support staff. So if there's any additional instructional associates, if school counselors, um, these ratios are put in the support staff. Funding, um, advanced placement, how many students are in advanced placement classes, and then the professional development opportunities that are available for the um, educators that are on the school site. Within the packet, there are three. There's an elementary, a middle, and a high school example. I wanted to make sure that um, we had a representation from across the district to look through. Um, and within it, and like I said, the document itself, I tried to research to find out when the last time the SARC template itself had been updated, and I could not find that information. So since, even since I was a site principal eight years ago, it was the same information that you put in there each year, and it is an accountability report card. Now, um, in, our, to, in, today's, um, in today's era, we really look at um, this, the data dashboard, our school dashboard, that contains a lot of information, and our LCAP plan, which goes, it dives really deep into the different services that are available. And then also the Williams report is a very comprehensive report that goes through instructional materials, um, facilities, and then teacher credentialing. Any public speakers to this item? Yes, Mr. Bill Beecher. Thank you. Good evening again. You're probably getting bored with me. Um, several months ago, I started tutoring a student at one of our local colleges. She was a graduate of Watsonville High School last year, 4.0 average. She's struggling in math. And I got a chance firsthand to see what the issues were with her knowledge of math or lack. So, <clears throat> the Aptos High School is what you were given in your package. I've compared that to the state. Uh, Aptos High, slightly better than the state, and that's not saying too much. But if I look at Watsonville High School and compare it to the state, 
the state data says that over half our students should be getting F's in math in high school. But they aren't because we're grading on the curve and we're telling our kids a lie and we're moving them forward without the proper foundation. So there are possible causes for this. We know that the students are entering high school significantly behind in math. That's hard to triage when they get to high school. The teachers aren't capable. If they were, why aren't we doing better? And there's a pressure to gate on the to grade on the curve and not onto the standard. And I made a presentation six years ago and showed hard data that it's only the math program where this exists. So there are remedies, improve elementary and middle school math. This is being done. I think a lot of the initiatives that we've seen over the last couple of years are showing we're making a difference. And so as you feed those kids through the group, high school math will get better, but that's gonna take a while. We need to hire better math teachers, but that's almost impossible because a math student coming out of college, starting salary 60 grand, average salary is 107, with a max of 165. You aren't gonna get any math teachers. And you should grade to the standard, why? Because if you don't and you dumb it down, you start to think you're actually doing well when in reality you aren't. And when you look at the state data, we suck. So, you need to put this on the agenda. We've been kicking this football for too long. Let's have an open discussion on what the problems are and the remedies. And I'll use a little quote, you've all seen it, continue to do the same thing and expecting different results is insanity. From Mr. Einstein. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Any discussion from the board? So with that, I'll take questions before we, I ask for approval to publish them on our district website and school site websites. I know, Lisa, that we have implemented some math changes um, in our curriculum. Um, we signed the partnership with Khan Academy, correct? And we're also using um, Engage New York, which is also known as, what's the, Engage New York is also known as, Get bridges. Bridges. bridges, but a lot of some of the teachers are doing the Khan of Academy programming. The Map Accelerator. The Map Accelerator, thank you, that's what I was looking for. The Map Accelerator um, to help their students improve in math scores, correct? Yes, and um, we're gonna have an upcoming presentation and we are seeing correlation between the classrooms that are using the Map Accelerator and our map growth scores. Any other discussion? Mr. Serpa, Trustee. And aside from those, that data that we use, we're, aren't we in the middle schools? We've implemented Alex? Yes, we have Alex. And are we having any, re any positive results from the implementation of those programs? We are having positive results. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Go ahead, Mr. So we will be discussing map data soon. We're actually, our one cheater is about ready to come out. Um, but we are seeing double digit growth. Um, in multiple grade levels. Um, and so we'll be speaking to the success that we're seeing all the way from second grade to sixth grade. So um, you'll be hearing about that when we release the scores. Okay. There was a couple things I was, and I it was thinking about it before and he got it, but I forgot what I was gonna say. Um, <laughs> one of the things I noticed is that, um, that's one thing that I can remember, um, is that often females do a lot better than males and in one place it was like huge you know how the difference between females I mean, in terms of how uh, they're doing a whole lot better than the males i don't know so i was just wondering you know and 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 often they did a little bit better at least but i was just wondering so <laughs> i don't know if we can f we have to focus more on males or something i don't know <laughs> about that but um we, we did take a look at that at the beginning of the year and it it is it was dependent wasn't even dependent it it varied from school site to school site whether it, it was the males or the females and which subject area it wasn't um any one like the females always did better in okay. the subject area yeah. okay so because i just noticed when i was looking at you know like this 
you know, that I was looking at through it and I thought, whoa, look at the females are doing it. You know, and obviously it wasn't, you know, I didn't see every school site, but yeah. Okay, I just checking. Uh, can I get a motion? I'll make a motion. Is there a approve? second? Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, agenda item 9.7 is up next, middle school science adoption recommendation. The report will be by Lisa. Uh, good evening once again. I, I'm actually just up here to introduce our um, science coordinator. Um, you approved his, uh, the hiring of Mr. Michael Russo earlier this year, and this is the first time he's um, in front of the board, and he's doing a fantastic job, so he's going to go for it. Thank you, Lisa. Hi, good evening. Hi. Good evening, Board President Dodge. Good evening, Board Trustees. Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, I am, well, first of all, thank you for approving my, uh, my hiring a couple of months ago. It was the first chance I got to thank you for that. Uh, I'm really here on behalf of a dedicated group of middle school teachers, uh, which made up the science, middle school science adoption committee. And I'm here to share with you just a quick overview of what that process was like and the recommendation to share with you uh, that they made at the end of that process. So um, just to give you an overview of the kind of timeline that happened, and I wasn't here at the beginning when a lot of this happened, so a lot of this credit goes to my predecessor, Rob Hoffman, and uh, uh, Jessica Sukulis, who was, is our uh, K-8 TOSA and science coach, who really took over the process in Rob's absence and before I came on in September. But what they started to do was uh, in spring, uh, a little less than a year ago, was they uh, selected middle school teachers who would participate in the pilot. Uh, they did textbook screenings, and they came up with two NGSS aligned uh, curricula that they decided to pilot. In over the summer, they had four days of training with publishers and also NGSS uh, training as well. And this fall, a group of 16 teachers piloted the two curricula. Um, we also, Jessica and I, before she went out on maternity leave, we did classroom observations. One of the most exciting things we did in this process as well, for me, coming on new in September, was doing student interviews and asking their opinions about the textbooks that they were being exposed to in their classroom. I'll tell you just a little bit more about that in a minute. And then also in the fall, after the first cycle, so eight of the 16 teachers, they uh, piloted in their classroom for one month one of the textbooks. And then they came back, did an analysis and evaluation of that, reflected on uh, their piloting of that, and then they swapped. And the next month, they used the other textbooks. And on November 21st, all of them came together, did their final evaluation and reflection, and we called it decision day. They actually voted on which one best served their students and in their opinion, was most user-friendly for them as teachers. And so we're here tonight to share that recommendation with you in the hopes that we can implement that new adoption this fall. So the two texts that they piloted was, one was Amplify, which comes out of UC Berkeley, Lawrence Hall of Science, and the other is TCI, which is an acronym for Teachers Curriculum Institute. Both of those are NGSS aligned curricula. I thought that might happen. I was trying to see the size of this podium from back there. And, all right, so just to uh, let you know the scope of who was involved in this process, we had nine schools participate, right? So we had our six middle schools and the junior high school, along with Mar Vista, which is K through six, Valencia, and then Alianza as well also participated. So that's where the nine schools come from. 
Uh, I represent over 500 students in those 16 teachers' classrooms, and Jessica and I actually interviewed uh, 71, uh, did, we did 71 students that we interviewed. And what we would do is when we would go in and observe and just watch the teacher and the students interacting with the new text that they were using, uh, we pulled, after a couple minutes of observing, we pulled groups of three students and we asked them questions like, how does this text motivate you, right? How does it support your language development? Anything else you want to tell us about the text? And then about five, six weeks later, when their teacher switched to the next text, the second cycle, we pulled the same exact students and we asked them the same exact questions. And it was so exciting because it just confirms what we all know, that students are in love learning, right? And when they're engaged. So, um, and I'll tell you the results of those interviews in a minute. Okay, just to give you a quick sense of some of the tools we used. We used uh, an NGSS aligned protocol called TIME. It stands for the Toolkit for Instructional Materials Evaluation. It's a pretty intense process. Um, the first one up there on the left is our district lens. And so that was developed after looking at assessment data and seeing what the needs of our students were. And the ones highlighted on there are uh, any prioritizing curricula that focused on student talk and discourse, multiculturalism, and bilingual resources. So those were some of the priorities we were looking at. The tool on the lower left, it's uh, looking at student learning and how effective is the curriculum in supporting that. And then the tool on the right is looking at how the curriculum supports the teacher in order to help the students learn. So you'll see like on the fourth one down, uh, support for students with diverse learning needs or support to monitor student progress. Um, all right, the moment we've been waiting for and uh, the decision day, you can see it was pretty unanimous. Um, the dark blue represents the teachers who said, I, can strong, I strongly agree with this program and can support it. And almost 85% of teachers felt that about Amplify. The other remaining 15 or so percent said, I can support this program and willing to go along with the choice. None of the 16 teachers um, strongly supported TCI. So I just want to say that uh, the Middle School Science Adoption Committee recommends that you, the Board of Trustees, approve Amplify as the new middle school science adoption beginning in the fall of this year. And I'll just close by saying that uh, Ed reports, they review curricula, um, and Amplify got really high scores on being aligned to NGSS, 25 out of 26 points, coherence and scope, 49 out of 56 points, and usability, uh, user friendliness for students and teachers, 50 out of 54 points. So I just want to, uh, on behalf of all those teachers and all our middle school teachers and students, uh, thank the board for your continued support. Oh, the students, yes, that was, Tell okay. Us about the students. By the way, <laughs> the students also preferred Amplify 58% uh, to 42% for TCI. Okay. Well, so, well, um, before that, um, we just any public speakers to this item? No. Okay. Any more discussion from the board? We have a question. Sure. So, um, how were students selected to participate as part of those? Yeah. Schools? Thank you. They were selected by the teacher, and we asked for a cross section of students. Mm -hmm. So, students of different <laughs> academic abilities. We asked for male and female students as well from each side. So teachers kind of self-selected the students. And I'm assuming we had representation from our English learner population? Yes, definitely. That was also part of the criteria, right. yeah. Uh, and that we, j we left it up to the teacher and told them that we were trying to get a good cross-section of students. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
So this was um, the presentation about how we picked a curriculum. I That's felt correct. like it should have been under more of a curriculum heading than a middle school science heading because there's no like meat to this presentation about what is this curriculum. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is it articulated to ninth grade? Like how is it going to be shepherding this group of students to ninth grade and improve the success of kids going into the sciences? Yeah. So... I didn't have time, I have notes here about, I shared a little bit about the ed reports and how it amplify the recommended curricula, got high scores on ed reports. Mm -hmm. um, so here's the other thing about the curriculum. It's uh, really a, a lines, first of all, it really promotes literacy with students. Um, this is just one unit. Right, this one's about uh, matter and energy in ecosystems. It's all phenomena based, which is what really um, targets, triggers students' uh, engagement from the very beginning. And then it, one of the things that teachers really liked about it is it puts the student in the role of a scientist, whether it's an ecologist, uh, whether it's an engineer, uh, it puts them in that role. I remember in one of the student interviews, uh, um, I know what I was going to show you here, there are 12 articles in the back of this, just in this unit. So it really promotes reading, literacy, student talk, and engaging students. So when we interviewed one, student, one group of students at Rolling Hills in particular, they came out and they were studying about a fecal transplant. And it was like, oh, it's called day 23, but we're only on day 12, and you can't believe what's happening. And they had to play like as a kind of, they had a, a doctor and try to figure out how the fecal transplant was helping this patient. But the students were, they were enthralled with it and engaged. So there's just a couple of quick ways in which Amplify will support one, our science goals and vision, and uh, helping students succeed around language and uh, literacy skills as well. Cross articulation, yeah, that's great. Yeah. One other question I have is um, the COE is preparing some type of standard-based curricula for science, and how, how does this fit into what is being prepared by COE? So I, I did want to mention that this is about the adoption. We do have an entire presentation coming in in two weeks by, um, by Mr. Russo that's going to go over the science. Um, however, I, um, that it, it, the curriculum is not implemented in all of the school districts. Um, that was actually inaccurate information that was given to you previously. Um, not for me, I, I wasn't the one that said it, um, but um, it was only Santa Cruz City Schools who, uh, who purchased that. It was not the other nine school districts in the county. It was purchased by the second largest school district in the county, which is Santa Cruz, but um, it was, um, many of the school districts have not um, purchased their science curriculum yet. Yeah, because he said that, that all 12 districts adopted. No. Yeah, I, I looked into that and that was not accurate statement. Oh, okay, all right, so, sorry. I sorry. rescind that question, yeah. thank you. The Shankar, did you have a question or? I just wanted to uh, clarify something um, about this curriculum. This curriculum is more of an interactive curriculum, correct? with the students, um, like you said, they're putting yeah. themselves in, in places. So it's a little bit different than the technical science curriculum that we grew up with. That's it's, right, it is, yeah. And that's okay. one of the uh, powerful points about it. And I think one of the things that attracted the teachers and the students as well, it wasn't TCI. What they said was it, it was like old school science yeah. with just kind of they felt like they tried to dress it up, uh, but amplifies the real deal. And a lot of the literature out there also uh, expresses similar kind of uh, reviews about it as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And Maria, Trustee Orozco. I'm just ready to make a motion. Okay. Um, can I have a motion and can I have a second? Second. Um, um, vote. 
All in favor of the item? Aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Motion passed. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. <laughs> Next up, 9.8, approve the appointment of an Alianza teacher and a provisional internship permit. Good evening, President Dodge, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, yes, before you is a provisional intern permit for a teacher that we hired um, for the second semester at Alianza. She is a Watsonville High alum. Um, she is finishing her program at UCSC and her major is Spanish. So it's really, we got really lucky that we were able to find a B-clad teacher uh, in the middle of the school year to help out Alianza. So I request approval of the PIP. Any public speakers? Any discussion from the board? Can I get a motion? Making a motion to approve okay. this teacher. Second. Second. Uh, can I go ahead and get a vote? All in motion, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you, motion passes. All right, next up, 9.9, .9, <laughs> approved resolution 19-20-24, support of measure G, which is now measure Y. So before we continue, um, it is 10.03. Correct. Right. right. So um, I would like to make a motion to approve um, to uh, to, to go to a later yeah to extend <laughs> the meeting uh, to eleven thirty just in case we need that additional time. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Um. So I, I'll go first, and then you can you can speak. Um, so the district um, in 2014, when this is, was originally put forth, um, the district did support the measure. Um, so as um, you all know, so I meet um, I meet quarterly with uh, Matt Huffaker, the city manager, and we were having a conversation um, about the measure and about the frankly, the damage that would occur if they did not have the continued funding for Measure G. Um, and so this um, resolution would support the former Measure G, now um, Measure Y. Um, I wanted, um, I just wanted to note two different um, additions. Um, so you'll see that many organizations throughout the community are going to be um, having very similar resolutions, so I just wanted to highlight how I customized it and the reason why I felt that um, we should um, support it. Um, and it's the, the fifth down, and it just says, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District is dedicated to providing resources and services for the whole child and recognizes that the safety and security of our students impacts their learning and social-emotional well-being. Um, and so, you know, I think what was said about the, um, about the previous resolution about the money that our municipalities and our cities get actually also support the schools. I feel this is true for that. Um, we did have this resolution come forward to PVPSA and we were able to hear from, um, from Captain Rodriguez and he mentioned when he was a patrol when this first came out and the 10 homicides that kind of boosted this um, and the differences of when he was a child in Watsonville and people would, you know, throw out guns and knives out of their car as they'd be driving by and that now you just don't see any of that. Um, and I don't want to steal your thunder um, because maybe you're going to say this, but they, they were able to add um, seven new new officers, which equates to 10%. So there's only 70 officers. They're able to um, add seven, which to me, 10% is, is a large amount. Um, and then they were also able to offer other um, professionals that really allowed them to do task force work that has supported the community. And the gentlemen are here to speak. So Paco, will you, you be speaking first? Uh, first, uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, board president, uh, vice president, uh, board and the staff. Uh, my name is Francisco Estrada. I'm the representative for District 4 in the city of Watsonville, and I'm the chair for the Measure Y committee, uh, renewal committee. I'm Kurt Voivoda, presently uh, battalion chief for the city of Watsonville Fire Department. I sit on the oversight committee for the current measure that's in place, the quarter cent sales tax for Measure G, and I also am uh, 
a committee member of the uh, campaign of Measure Y. And so we appreciate that you're considering uh, or supporting Measure Y. Uh, there's a, a lot of uh, great things about uh, Measure Y, and I think the voters were wise to support it in 2014, and we're hoping that they will give us a second opportunity to do so. Uh, I think we've uh, met the fiduciary uh, responsibilities associated with uh, managing uh, this measure. And uh, the, the stats speak for themselves. Total crimes are down 9% in the city of Watsonville. Crimes to individuals down 17%, and crimes to property uh, down 29%. And one of the things that we are very, very proud of is the Fire Academy for Youth that we were able to launch this past year. Yeah. And uh, you didn't steal our thunder. Um, <laughs> I believe they, they've uh, been able to add one more police officer, making a total of eight um, through this funding. Uh, the fire department's been able to add seven new uh, firefighters to it. It's also uh, allowed us to uh, replace some aging fleet. Uh, with the current measure, we, we were able to buy uh, two new fire engines, and currently we just purchased a fire truck. Um, the truck is the one with the long ladder on it that goes up about 100 feet and uh, helps protect the citizens. Also, we're able with those, those seven firefighters are crucial because they are uh, where the boots hit the ground. Those seven firefighters are medics. That's advanced life support that goes out on every rig we staff. And that measures allowed that. Prior to Measure G, our fire department was looking at cuts. We were looking at possible layoffs. We, we had equipment that was failing. We borrowed equipment at times. Um, so it's crucial. Moving forward with this, uh, with this measure Y is a continua continuization of the current measure that's in place. It's not a new one. It doesn't raise the taxes. And it's a quarter cent sales tax for the, for the city of Watsonville, the citizens of Watsonville. So, with that, with that said, moving forward with, with Measure Y, the only difference uh, from Measure G to Measure Y, there's a small am amount, 8%, that's going to go to Parks and Rec. And that's for, uh, to reach out to our, our high-risk youth programs in, the, in there. So thank you for supporting it. So in the motion, just because I, I know that there was some concern on clarity, I did follow the template. But um, if you could, um, if we would be able to make the amendment to say support a former Measure G slash a Measure Y so that um, it's just really apparent that you all know what you're voting on. I'd like to make a motion to approve this resolution for Measure Y. Continuation of Measure G. I second. second. Well, I just discussion. Oh, okay, I just wanted to ask. So I know I know you're doing a lot of well with Parks and Rec. You're going to add more youth programs, but during in terms of you know homicides and all this, I mean you did not only for police and fire, but you did programs for the youth, obviously. And so just talk to talk to me a little bit about all the stuff you did for young people too. With the, with the G and now I. So some of the successes that we always like to highlight are uh, like the PAL program, the Contigo program. Yeah, the PAL which, program. Um, you know, they, they believe in the uh, philosophy of restorative justice. And uh, I believe like 90% of youth that have participated in these programs have not reoffended. Um, they get mentorship. They get activities. They get exposure to the greater world so that they understand that, um, you know, it's about... Uh, discovering themselves is about figuring out what they want to do with their lives and then how they can contribute to the community. And as I had mentioned before, the Fire Academy was just a remarkable thing. And I don't know if Kurt, you want to just uh, tell, tell them a little bit more about the Academy. Yeah. With the Fire Academy, it, it was a mini academy for our, our youth, um, ages I believe s <coughs> around 16 through 18, participated in it. And it was a mini, mini academy for them to give, give them a look at what it, what it takes to become a firefighter and um, it was the first time we were able and have enough funding to put it on before all those programs in the fire department were cut uh, with Chief Lopez he spearheaded that 
and targeted at youth risk and brought them in and did a, uh, I believe it was a two-week academy. And they went through everything that our firefighters go through in an academy when they're hired. Wow. And, um, and they graduated. It was really successful. And this coming year, we're looking at doing two academies. Okay. That's wonderful. Well, that sounds great. And then uh, just, you know, part of the equation in, in increasing safety in the community, decreasing crime, is prevention. You know, it's hard to put a dollar amount on the value of prevention, mm -hmm. but it, at, in the long run, it's the best investment, it's the cheapest investment with, with the highest returns. Yeah. And so that's why we wanted to increase the amount that was allocated to parks and youth uh, services, because in the long run, uh, as I mentioned, in the generation or two, I think we'll, we'll really notice the difference. Yeah. Right. I have one last question, oh, if I may. I think a trustee shocker. Or, oh, okay. Yeah, oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. Is the um, the percentage allocated to Parks and Rec different from what it was last time around? Uh, no, no, it wasn't at all. Was I, there anything? I could answer that for you. Um, the the current me uh, the current measure that's in was a quarter cent sales tax, and it was for uh, the police department and fire department. It was a sixty forty split. And that's, that's the two departments that received it. The measure moving forward would add 8% to, to okay. Parks and Rec. So, that was not so the previous the one, one, Parks and Rec, was not on that. And that's, that's the, the change moving forward with Measure Y. So it would be, um, instead of 40 for fire, it will be 38. And then uh, police department will, will be getting um, 54, and then 8% to Parks and Rec. We're not good at math, but it should add up. It adds up. It adds up. It adds up. It's okay. It adds up. Let's do it. I can do it. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight the fact that, you know, we are giving priority to Parks and Rec because it's such a, like you mentioned, is the prevention piece that I think we really need to be investing more on. So. And the Fire Academy follows our CTE pathways to give youth a chance, a chance for a career, mm -hmm. to exactly. otherwise that they wouldn't get a chance to explore in Watsonville. Exactly. That's right. yeah. okay. And just to finish up, um, I've been volunteering on the campaign for a while, and if you're still undecided, there's a website called WatsonvilleForward2020.com. Um, there's a lot of great pictures, you know, simplified things, and if you also want to get active on the campaign, you can also sign up to walk. So. And there's signs available for your and yard. And there's oh, buttons. Right on. Okay. So yeah. since we already had a, a first and a second, um, can we just go ahead and take a vote? All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, agenda item 9.10, edition of May 20, May 20th, 2020, meeting to board schedule. Yeah. So we we originally went to. Um, reserve April 15th for the Mellow Center. When we went back after your approval, it was no longer available. So we set the date um, on May 20th, 2020, um, because that is, um, was a date, a Wednesday that was available to us and it was available for Mellow. So we have now secured it. I recognize it isn't as great um, because we were going to do it on in a on April 15th, which was going to be a Wednesday that was only one board meeting in the month. Um, but I think it will be celebratory in nature and um, it it should be fairly be able to be fairly quick, probably um, two hours, um, but it will be all smiles. So um, I'm hoping that we can put it on the agenda so that we can have the special board study session that is just for student recognition. Thank you. Right. Any public speakers to this item? No. Any discussion from the board? Just really quick. So thank you for getting this done. I know that was a request of mine um, last year. Um, and so I, I do believe that students receive proper recognition. I don't think um, that during board meetings, regular board meetings, that, that was the case. Um, but it is a special board meeting, so how would, are we going to be following meeting protocol? 
um, for that day? Well, no. So what we'll okay. do, we will have to do the Pledge of Allegiance, and we'll do, we will have to do the approval of the agenda, and then we'll just get to um, being able to recognize the students. So we do have to do um, two items. So we have to do the opening, the pledge, and then the approval of the agenda, and then we're off to the races. Great. Right. Okay. Thank you. So uh, if there's no additional comments, I would like to make a motion to approve this item. A second. Was there a second? Second. All right. Um, I will now call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? No. Motion passes. Next up, item 9.11, approve the Gas State Project and CTE Program Fund Development Work presented by Dr. Rodriguez. Yeah, thank you. So we've had a lot of great success with our grant writer. Um, there is some, um, there, there's always some risk uh, on hiring someone um, full time. So we're gonna try this as an intermediate step. Um, so this is um, Linda Bixby. Linda Bixby is, um, a significant staple in the community has been um, linked to agriculture. She currently just fundraised a um, million dollars for the opening of the brand new library um, that is up in, um, it isn't Scotts Valley, but Boulder Creek or somewhere around there. I'm sorry, Felton, Felton thank you. Um, and so what she would be doing is she would be um, fund recruiting for us in order to be able to do the proportional share um, for the Lagrassi. So they gave us half a million dollars. That isn't enough to build the over a million dollar facility that we need. The positive of this is we are able to use CTIG funding so it's not coming out of general funding because it's leading to a culinary pathway. And so I think this is a great way, one, to test the waters on um, getting an additional way to have someone else that is providing grant support um, with really little risk. Um, and um, it would um, you know, reap great benefits because um, we would be able to also have a key messenger out there talking about the good work that we're doing around CTE. And so I'm asking for your um, approval. So any public speakers? No. Any discussion? So I just want to thank Michelle for this because this is something that I mentioned to you before about the possibility of hiring a second grant writer um, for our district. And thoughts if this works out, is that something that you think we'll be moving towards? Yes. Thank you. So I'd like to make an motion to approve if there's no other comments. Uh, we have a first, we have a second. Um, can I go ahead and get a vote? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Motion passes, and I, I vote yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, agenda item 9.12, core SIPs agreement, S19-030. Yeah. So this is actually a really great problem to have in that um, so what we're having is students are more and more prepared so I'll give you a specific example so we have SIPs implementation now in each and every school within the district um, so if previously I was a second grade teacher I was receiving students significantly below grade level so that meant that my first year of receiving SIPs instruction and coaching I most likely was teaching a beginning level uh, module that is not at grade level we're now seeing really great as you guys know we've had 89% of our students that participated in SIPs were able to read independently by the end of the year um, so those students no longer are reading at the beginning they now need either challenge or extension and so those are different modules for our teachers. They're not, it's not actually the same set of routines. And so we were able to reduce, originally this contract a um, year ago was 300,000. It's now 140. So we took out completely the admin piece because we now do that in-house and support in-house. Um, and then we're also, we were also able to reduce from two consultants um, to just one. So now we only have Anne Leon that's supporting us. Um, we used to have Nancy that came out as well. So we had two consultants. Um, but it really is necessary for us to be able to make that leap 
um, because we need to be able to have the coaching for the new modules. If not, we will revert back. So they'll receive the students higher up, um, but then we won't effectively and um, implement the program. Um, so we are hoping that after this, um, then we would be able to do everything in-house because now teachers are teaching grade level modules, which is a, which is a really good thing. Uh, any public speakers? Any discussion from the board? Um, can I have a motion? I make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Uh, um, I'll now call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Next up, agenda item 9.13, second reading of board policy 3350, travel expenses by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. So this is just the two slight changes that we brought forth in the first reading. So it basically allows for tips and gratuities, um, and then also it allows um, for me to approve, authorize um, overnight stays within a 60 mile radius. Um, and again, it was the example I gave you previously was um, when we had a, a large group of teachers that went to Silomar. Um, which is a math conference, and it technically is with is not um, with it's it's it was grant funded, and it's inside the 60 miles. Um, they should have had not been allowed to stay, um, but because of traffic patterns, as we all know, getting up there um, it takes <laughs> it takes a long time, especially um, those of us living down here. Um, and so this would allow me to be able to um, make those approvals um, when I feel that it's prudent. But we'll, we'll use it judiciously. Any public speakers for this item? No. Any discussion from the board? No. Okay. Uh, can I get a motion? So moved. Second? Second. I will now call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Agenda item 9.14, approve applied research results based accounting work agreement. So really, um, probably my first month here, and then since then, I've been talking about program evaluation, and do we know that the money in which we are investing is worth it? Um, so last year, we did, um, in an effort to support, we did hire a TOSA um, to allow our research and evaluation department to do some program evaluation. Um, also, it's really the responsibility of every director that's out there to also be doing that work, not just research and evaluation. But what we know is that's a skill set. And frankly, we hadn't been using data as well as we probably could have, um, and then definitely not doing program evaluation as much as we could have. So what this, this is Susan Brucci, so this is ASR. Um, I've worked with her now for three and a half years. I find her super competent and um, supportive. She knows her stuff. Um, what she would be doing is she would be doing at least 10 um, professional development sessions with what we call expanded cabinet. So that's every director and coordinator in the district, as well as principals, because principals should be doing this as well. And they, she would be training them on the principles of program evaluation so that when we invest the $45 million worth of um, program money every year that we're putting into our system, that we're getting the, the return on investment that we need, and we're looking at what should we do, what shouldn't we do, and making those modifications. So I recognize that this is an expense. However, that's why I mentioned the 40 million each year. If we make sure that each, if all that money is used effectively year after year, it will reap um, many more benefits than the cost of this um, contract. And so I'm asking for the approval. Any public speakers to this item? No. Any discussion with the board? Um, I just want to say, you know, I know you talked to me about we are trying to even eliminate some of our TOSAs in order to reduce the amount of money that we're spending out there, you know, in terms of saving money. So, um, so even though this is a TOSA, we are eliminating TOSAs as well, right? Um, no, this is actually a consultant agreement. So the TOSA oh. position we did not refill. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, but we, okay, but I just want to say that we haven't f filled s more than one TOSA right. position. So we eliminated three TOSA positions. So that's what I'm saying. We have eliminated TOSA positions, so we're not having this person there. It's not like we're, you know, 
You know what I'm saying? We've saved some money eliminating some toasters, so this is not hopefully. I mean, when we look at, it's kind of like what I said at my state of the district, we look at two different things. We look at quality and efficiency, right? So I've been working a lot on efficiency. This looks at quality. Mm -hmm. How well are we doing what we say we're doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what I wonder if it's safe. Any other discussion from the board? I have a question. <clears throat> so typically when money is awarded or allocated for programs, there's supposed to be a part of that allocation that is set aside for either program monitoring or evaluation. Is that right? Or no? Well, there's a reporting piece. And so there is always program evaluation. I think when, um, when you're looking at like state compliance items, what they're looking at is you're saying these are the objectives, this is what I did and how did I do it? The problem with the state just compliance level versus what I'm talking about is then the next steps of how do we know what we know and then once we know it, what do we do about it? And I think that the compliance piece doesn't hit that last part. And frankly, and a lot of times I'm happy about it, but frankly, there's not much bite if you don't do what you say you're going to do on most compliance pieces because all you have to do is provide a justification of why it didn't happen and then you continue to get the money. And that's why in every system in education, it's not just here, in every system we continue to do the same because frankly we're a lot of times allowed to do the same. Right, because it's hard for legislatures and, and other governing bodies to pull money from, from districts. And so then you're given a lot of leniencies. So what I want us to do is each and every one of us to be thoughtful, but we also have to provide professional development and capacity building around that if no one has had to do that in the past. I think this is a great idea. So I'll be supporting this, thank you. I'll, I'll make a motion actually to support I just have now. one question and then I'll support your, I'll second your motion, Kim. Um, is this going to be an ongoing thing or is this something we're just gonna do once and then I'm just clarifying that yeah. for. Just once, so that we're teaching people to fish here, we're not giving them the fish. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, I'll second your motion. Mm -hmm. Any more discussion? All right, um, can I go ahead and get a, a vote? All in favor? Aye. aye. I'll oppose, uh, I, I oppose. Um, one, two, three, four. Five one. Okay. Uh, next, uh, consent item, agenda item number 10, consent and agenda. Um, are there any public speakers to the consent agenda? No. Are there any items that the board wishes to defer? All right. Can I have a motion on the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve. Uh, second. Second. All right. I will call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Consent agenda passes. And um, do we have any? Deferred consent items, closed session items. Um, we do have closed session. We always do. We okay. always do. Yes. <laughs> so under item 2.1, I move to approve the recommendation of the district administration for a full expulsion for the remainder of the 1920 school year and the first semester of the 2021 school year with placement at another school outside of the district on the strict behavior contract for student number. 192012. Um, make a motion to approve. Right, I'll um, I'm, I'm sorry. And we actually voted indoors, so, so I'm did. just reporting out. Okay. Yeah, so I'm not making voted, a motion yeah. by reporting yeah. out. So we approved um, the, expul the expulsion with a district recommendation for student number 192012 with a 601 vote. Mm -hmm. Okay. It looks like our upcoming meeting. Uh, and we actually have two yeah. more items. Oh, I'm sorry. So under item 2.2, .2, I move to approve the certificated, uh, a certificated personnel report as presented by the district administration with the addition of one separation. A second. All, right. all, all in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm sorry. We're just reporting out, right? Yeah, it's easy. No, easy this one's not reporting easy. out. We're actually voting. Oh, we're voting on that one. Mm -hmm. We're all confused tonight. It's generally, generally. I know. Your suspension I just, is <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. 
sorry. Jen's, Jen's supposed Go to with do Jen. the recording. Take it over. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so motion, to, motion number two. <laughs> Jen's supposed to do the rest. Yeah. Um, I move to approve the classified personnel report as, re, as presented by district administration on January 22nd, 2020, with 31 and two additional action items. Second. <laughs> all, right. all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Is there any more? That's the two. All right, so That's the next upcoming different. meeting is February 14th, which I think is Valentine's Day, but I'm not, could be wrong. Oh, it says, it says no, 14th. February 12th is not Valentine's Day. 14th is. 14th is, but our meeting is not on a Friday. I know. Okay. But I mean, our, our meeting's on the 12th, which is my birthday. My birthday is oh, on okay. My birthday Sorry. is Abraham Lincoln's birthday. All right, so thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for hanging in there with me. Abraham Lincoln and me have the same birthday.